Prologue to Seven Keys to Ball Paint by George M. Cohen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Seven Keys to Ball Paint A Mysterious Melodramatic Farce. Characters In Order of Their Appearance Elijah Quimby, read by Zach Hoyt. Mrs. Quimby, read by Joanna Michael Hoyt. William Hallowell McGee, the novelist, read by Andrew Gantz. John Bland, the millionaire's right hand man, read by Son of the Exiles. Mary Norton, the newspaper reporter, read by Devorah Allen. Mrs. Rhodes, the charming widow, read by the story girl. Peters, the hermit of Baldpate, read by Alan Mapstone. Myra Thornhill, the blackmailer, read by Jen Broda. Lumax, the mayor's man Friday, read by T.J. Burns. Jim Cargan, the crooked mayor of Rutan, read by Larry Wilson. Thomas Hayden, the president of the R&D Suburban RR, read by Thomas Peter. Jiggs Kennedy, read by Christopher Feckler. Cop, read by David Purdy. The owner of Bald Pate, read by Mike Manalakis. The scene is laid in the office of Bald Pate Inn. Time, the present. Seven Keys to Baldpate, Act One. At rise of curtain, the stage is bare. No lights on the stage except the rays of the moon shining through glass door and the sky above. The wind is heard howling outside. The effect is that of a terrific storm taking place. Everything within the scene proves that it is a deserted, desolate spot. In fact, an inn, a summer resort, on the mountains closed for the winter. After thirty seconds, Elijah Quimby appears at glass door upstage and is seen swinging a lantern. He does this as if guiding someone who is following a sort of a signal to Mrs. Quimby, who presently appears trudging behind him. He hands her the lantern while he fumbles with a bunch of keys he has taken from his pocket. She gives him a light from the lantern while he finds the right key and unlocks the door. As the door swings open, the wind is heard howling unmercifully. He holds the door open for her to enter, then follows her in, closing the door. They both stamp their feet to get them warm. Mrs. Quimby goes down right center, holding the lantern and peering round the room, then goes up right and to center, and down to table left, on which she places the lantern. Quimby, after locking the door, goes slowly down left to table, meanwhile stamping feet, removing earmuffs, and placing cap and mittens on table. Mrs. Quimby removes her mittens, and they both stand rubbing their hands and ears. All this business is done without a word being spoken. The reason for it is to prove to the audience that the night is bitterly cold, and that the two people are half frozen after their climb up the mountain. Quimby, at table left, right of Mrs. Quimby, shivering. You know, Mother, I think it's colder in here than it is outside. Mrs. Quimby, shivering. I, I was going to say the same thing, Elijah. Maybe we'd better open the door and let in some warm air. You better not. The snow will blow all over the place. See if there's any logs over there, and we'll build a fire. Indicates fireplace with a nod of her head. Quimby starts right, stops, and stamps his feet. You know, Mother, I think my feet are froze. I can't feel them when I walk. Knocks hands together. 
town clock ready. I don't wonder after that climb up the mountain. Lord, I'll never forget this night. I'm about perished. She straightens chairs, etc., while Quimby is looking for logs. Any logs there? Yep, plenty of them. I got this thing all ready anyway. I was going to build a fire when I was up here last week. I'll have them blazing in a minute if I can find them darned matches. Searches through his pockets. I can swear I put a box of them in my pocket before I left the house. Finds them. Yep, here they are. You'd better light a lamp first so you can see what you're doing. That's a good idea. Clock in distance strikes eleven while he is scratching the match and lighting lamp over fireplace right. Note. Footlights up slightly when lamp is turned up. Mrs. Quimby, standing at foot of stairs. Eleven o'clock. Yep, that's what it is, eleven o'clock. Goes upstage and looks through glass door. That train's been in over twenty minutes already. I suppose it's the storm that delays him. Tain't over a ten-minute walk up the mountain from the depot. Comes down right center. Mrs. Quimby goes to right near desk. Maybe the train's late on account of the storm. No, I heard it signal the crossing at Asquewan Junction a half hour ago. That fellow will be here before we know it. Hands her matches. Light the other lamp, will you, mother, while I get at this fire? Mrs. Quimby takes matches and lights lamp up left near stairway. He builds fire in fireplace. Both are busily engaged in fixing room, heating and lighting it during the following conversation. Maybe we should have gone to the depot to meet him. Quimby, going center. No, we shouldn't have done nothing of the kind. The telegram just said to come here and open up the place and have it ready for him. Them's the instructions, and them's the only thing I follow her, is instructions. Start towards right. Mrs. Quimby, going center. But what do you suppose anybody wants to be doing in a summer hotel on the top of a mountain in the dead of winter? Mother, you know I can't figure out nothing. Goes up to door, peers out, then comes down to Mrs. Quimby. If I could, I'd have been a multimillionaire years ago, instead of an old fool caretaker. Goes nearer to Mrs. Quimby. Dust up a bit there, will you, mother, and make the place look a little respectable? Goes towards fireplace. She'll be going all right in a minute now. Mrs. Quimby, dusting with cloth she has taken from the foot of the stairs. What's his name again? McGee, I think the telegram says. Meets Mrs. Quimby at center. McGee? Wait a minute, I'll make sure. Takes telegram from his pocket. Mrs. Quimby takes telegram from him and goes left. Give it to me, I want to read it myself. The whole thing's very mysterious to me. Goes table and sits, reading by light of lantern. Quimby goes towards Mrs. Quimby. Fire begins to blaze up. Of course it's mysterious, but it's none of our business. Mr. Bentley is the owner of Baldpate Inn. If Mr. Bentley wants to permit some darn fool to come to this place to be froze to death by stale air, to be frightened to death by spooks, it's his concern and not ours. Turns and looks at fire, which is blazing. Ah, there she goes. She's blazing up fine. That'll warm it up a little. Goes left center to Mrs. Quimby during next speech. Mrs. Quimby reading message slowly. My friend, William Hallowell McGee, will arrive in Asquimont Falls tonight on the 1040. He will occupy Bald Pay Inn, so be prepared to receive him there and turn the key over to him and do whatever you can to make him comfortable. He has important work to do and has chosen Bald Pay for his workshop. Follow instructions, ask no questions. Hal Bentley. Quimby has been listening attentively. Sounds like them black hand notes to send a rich man, don't it? I can't understand it for the life of me. Hands telegram back to Quimby. Mother. Mrs. Quimby, over to Quimby, center. Yes? Quimby, right of center. Maybe the father's committed some crime and is coming here to hide. Do you think so, Elijah? I don't know. I say maybe. Well, if that's so, why should Mr. Bentley be interested in such a man? Quimby, thinks. I never thought of that. Thinks. Well, whatever it is, it's none of our business, and we mustn't mix in other people's affairs. Goes right. Mrs. Quimby thinks a moment, then comes down near Quimby. Elijah. Quimby looks up. What? Do you think I'd better fix up one of them rooms? Sure, he'll have to have a place to sleep. Here. Gives her key. That opens the linen closet. You'd better fix up that first room to the left. Points to room on balcony right. 
That's the one Mr. Bentley always takes when he comes. Mrs. Quimby, as she goes toward stairs, taking lantern from table. And you'd better put another log on the fire. Quimby goes towards fireplace. He'll probably be chilled to the bone by the time he climbs that mountain. Do you think he'll find his way alone? Goes upstairs during speech. Oh, he'll find his way all right. The station agent will most likely direct him. Puts log on fire, which blazes up. Mrs. Quimby going up the stairs. Occupying a summer hotel in the dead of winter. It beats all what some people will do. Exit door left, leaving door open. Quimby takes out his pipe and sits thinking near fire. Humph. It's pretty darn mysterious, all right. Lights pipe and smokes. I'll be jiggered if I can figure it out. Mrs. Quimby remains inside room for counts after Q, then comes from room carrying linen and bed coverings in her arms. She crosses balcony to room right of balcony and exits, closing door. Quimby sits smoking and thinking. McGee appears at door upstage and peers through. He is carrying a suit and typewriter case. He puts them down and knocks on window. Quimby doesn't move at first, but sits listening to make sure he has heard a sound. McGee repeats the knocking. Quimby shifts around in his chair, looks up towards the window, sees a form there, then gets up and sneaks along down stage until he gets two foot of stairs, then calls in suppressed tones to Mrs. Quimby. Mother! Mother! No answer from Mrs. Quimby. He runs halfway upstairs and calls a bit louder. Mother! Mrs. Quimby appears on balcony, peers over and sees Quimby. You call me, Elijah? Hush, don't talk so loud. Warns her to be quiet. Mrs. Quimby, lowering her voice. What's the matter? They both listen for a second. McGee's third rap comes. Good Lord, what's that? Quimby on stairs. It's him, he's here. He points to door upstage. Who? The telegram, I mean the man. Mrs. Quimby starts down the stairs. Where? At the door. McGee again raps impatiently. Mrs. Quimby urging Quimby down the stairs. Why don't you let him in? Quimby, both come downstairs. Do you think I'd better? Well, ain't that what the telegram said? Why, yes, of course, but... Mrs. Quimby, shoving Quimby toward door. You've got your instructions. Go on and do as you're told. McGee knocks again and rattles the doorknob. Quimby, in a loud voice as he goes up towards door. Yes, yes, just a minute, just a minute. As Quimby goes up to door, Mrs. Quimby comes down left. Quimby unlocks door and swings it open. The wind howls. McGee, carrying the two cases, enters and comes to center and stands bowing, first to Mrs. Quimby and then to Quimby, then drops the cases in the middle of the stage, looks around the room for a moment, wild-eyed, then sees fire burning and goes over to it as fast as his half-frozen legs will allow him. He pulls chair in front of fire and sits warming himself. Quimby's stand center, watching him in amazement. As soon as McGee has entered, Quimby has locked the door and come down right. As McGee sits, Quimby goes to Mrs. Quimby at left center. Mrs. Quimby, aside to Quimby. The four things have froze. Quimby approaches McGee, Mrs. Quimby following him to fireplace. What's the matter, young fellow? Are you cold? McGee smiles a sickly smile, shakes his head, laughs half-heartedly, then replies. <laughs> Am I cold? I feel pretty rocky, but I've got to laugh at that one. Mrs. Quimby, aside to Quimby. Better give him a drink of whiskey. Yes, I guess so. Takes flask from his pocket and hands it to McGee. Here, young fellow, try a little of this. McGee looks up, sees Flask, and grabs it. Thanks. Takes a long drink. Quimby goes center to Mrs. Quimby. Mrs. Quimby, aside to Quimby. Do you suppose it's him? Quimby, aside. How do I know? Mrs. Quimby, aside. 
Well, ask him and find out. McGee offers Flask to Quimby. Thanks again. A thousand thanks. Oh, you just put that in your pocket. You might need it later on. Thanks. Mrs. Quimby picks up cases from floor and takes them to table left. You're Mr. McGee, ain't you? Right. What's left of me is still McGee. You expected me, of course. Oh, yes. We got Mr. Bentley's telegram all right. My name's Quimby. So I surmised. This lady is my wife, Mrs. Quimby. Points to Mrs. Quimby, who crosses to McGee at fireplace. I thought as much. Delighted, Mrs. Quimby. Bows to Mrs. Quimby without rising. Glad to meet you, Mr. McGee. You'll pardon me for not rising, but really, I'm terribly cold. Mrs. Quimby goes to Quimby during the following speech. That's all right. You sit there and get head up. We've been living here in the mountains so long we don't mind the cold as much as strangers do, but even we felt it tonight, didn't we, Elijah? That's right, Mother. This is an uncommon cold night. McGee rises, removes overcoat, muffler, and hat, places them on chair. That little trip from the railroad station to the top of the mountain has taught me to firmly believe everything Jack London ever wrote about and everything old Dr. Cook ever lied about. Crosses to left center, looking at everything, very much interested, and rubbing his hands. So this is bald pate, is it? Well, well, well. Mrs. Quimby, right center, aside to Quimby. Don't he talk funny? Quimby, left of Mrs. Quimby, aside. Yes, acts funny too. Something's the matter with him, sure. Both watch McGee closely. McGee, coming center. You say you received Mr. Bentley's telegram saying I would be here? Yes, it only came about an hour ago, so we didn't have much time to prepare. I didn't decide to come here until four o'clock this afternoon. We were scared most to death getting a telegram in the middle of the night. I'm very sorry to have taken you out on a night like this, but it was altogether necessary in order that I accomplish what I've set out to do. Let me see. The rooms above are equipped with fireplaces, I believe. Looks up at rooms on balcony. Mrs. Quimby crosses center to McGee. Yes, I'm just fixing up one of the rooms. I'll start the fire, too. I'll have it all ready for you inside of five minutes. Crosses to right. Gets wood from box and comes right of Quimby. Lights ready. Oh, I wish you would. Looks round room. Yes, this would be too big a barn to work in. Quimby's look at each other. I'll no doubt be more comfortable up there. Continues to take in surroundings. Quimby, aside to Mrs. Quimby. He says he's going to work. I wonder what he means. Mrs. Quimby, aside, crossing left of Quimby. Pump him. Try to find out. Aloud. Give me the matches. Here you are. He hands her a box of matches. Mrs. Quimby, with wood in her arms, starts for stairs and goes up on balcony. This, I presume, is the hotel office? That's right. McGee strolls around stage, looking at everything carefully. Quimby, watching him closely. Well, well, this certainly is old John H. Seclusion himself. Lights go up. Mr. and Mrs. Quimby, together. Good, Good Lord, Lord, where did those, where did lights, those come lights come from? from? Good Lord, what's happened? Good Lord, what's happened? As lights go up, Quimby darts behind desk right. Mrs. Quimby is leaning over balcony center. Both are frightened. McGee laughs. <laughs> Don't be alarmed, Mrs. Quimby. It's all right. I think I can explain this thing. Mr. Bentley has probably had the power turned on. He knew I'd have to have some real light for this kind of work. Mrs. Quimby exits into room right, on balcony, closing the door. McGee goes to Quimby up right. I suppose you're wondering what the devil I'm doing here. That's just what I was wondering, young fellow. Well, I'll try to explain, although I'm not sure you'll understand. Sit down, Mr. Quimby. Quimby hesitates. It's all right. Sit down. Quimby gets chair and places it right center, then sits. Now, you are not, I take it, the sort of man to follow closely the light and frivolous literature of the day? How's that? You don't read the sort of novels that are sold by the pound in the department stores. Nope. Well, I write those novels. The dickens you do. Wild, thrilling tales for the tired businessman's tired wife. Shots in the night, chases after fortunes, Cupid busy with his arrows all over the place. It's good fun. I like to do it. And there's money in it. You don't mean to tell me. Oh, yes. Considerable. 
Of course, they say I'm a cheap, melodramatic ranter. They say my thinking process is a scream. Perhaps they're right. Moves chair out and sits left center. Perhaps. Did you ever read The Scarlet Satchel? Never. That's one of mine. Is it? I've come here to bald pate to think, to get away from melodrama, if possible, to do a novel so fine and literary that Henry Cabot Lodge will come to me with tears in his eyes and beg me to join his bunch of self-made immortals. And I'm going to do all this right here in this inn, sitting on this mountain, looking down on this little old world as Jove looked down from Olympus. What do you think of that? Quimby shakes his head, affecting an air of understanding. Maybe it's all for the best. Of late I've been running short of material. Rises, moves chair to right of table, and goes to Quimby. I've needed inspiration. A title gave me that, the lonesomest spot on earth, suggested by my very dear friend and your employer, Mr. Hal Bentley. What and where is the lonesomest spot on earth, I asked. A summer resort in winter, said he. He told me of Baldpate, dared me to come. I took the dare, and here I am. Quimby, rising and going to McGee at center. You mean you're going to write a book? That's just exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to novelize Baldpate. I'm here to get atmosphere. Quimby laughs. Ha! Huh. Well, to get plenty of that, all right. When are you going to start in? Just as soon as I absorb my surroundings and make a few mental notes. You see, I do most of my work in the dead of night. I find I concentrate more readily from midnight on. But I must have absolute solitude. The crackle of the fire, the roar of the wind, and the ticking of my watch will alone bear me company at Baldpate Inn. This all sounds very strange and weird to you, I suppose. How's that? I say you can't quite fathom me. Well, you're here of your own accord, I take it. My dear Mr. Quimby, I'm here on a bet. On a bet? Exactly. I have here an explanation of the thing in Bentley's handwriting. Takes paper from his pocket. Do you care to look it over yourself, or would you rather I'd read it to you? Yes, go on and read it. I like to hear you talk. Sits right center. McGee smiles. Ah, uh, then my personality has wormed its way into your good graces. How's that? I mean to say I evidently appeal to you. Well, I don't know as you particularly appeal to me, but... But what? Quimby laughs, confused. Uh, uh, oh, I, I guess I better not say it. Come on, what's on your mind? Tell me. Well, to be honest with you, I can't figure out whether you're a smart man or a damn fool. McGee laughs. <laughs> Would you believe it, my dear sir? I've been stalled between those two opinions of myself for years. My publishers say I'm a smart man. My critics call me a damn fool. However, that's neither here nor there. This... Indicating paper. ...will perhaps clear away the cloud of mystery to some extent. Oh, perhaps Mrs. Quimby would be interested enough to hear this also. Will you call her, please? Sure. Rises and calls. Mother! Oh, mother! Mrs. Quimby appears at door right on balcony and comes to center of it. Yes, I'm all through. Everything's ready up here. Leans over balcony center. You'd better come up, mister, and see if it satisfies you before we go. It's all right, Mrs. Quimby. I'll take your word for it that everything's all right. Come on down here, mother. Mr. McGee wants to read something to you. Places chair for her right center next to his own. Is that so? Starts downstairs. I started the fire, so I guess the room will be comfortable enough to sleep in by the time you get ready to go to bed. Is downstairs by now. Sit down, mother. What? Go on. See, I'm sitting. Mrs. Quimby goes towards Quimby. Mr. McGee is going to tell us why he's here. Mrs. Quimby sits left of Quimby. Is that so? Lord, I'd love to know. I have just explained to your husband that I am an author. I do popular novels, and I'm here to write a story. A story of Bald Pate Mountain, laid in this very hotel, perhaps in this identical room. I am to complete this task within twenty-four hours, starting at midnight tonight. Understand, Mother? He's going to write a book. Mrs. Quimby to McGee. Going to write a book in twenty-four hours? That is the wager that has been made between Mr. Bentley and myself. He claimed it couldn't be done. 
I claimed it could. Five thousand dollars worth of his sporting blood boiled, and he dug for his fountain pen and checkbook. I covered the bet, and we posted the checks at the 44th Street Club. He was to choose the godforsaken spot. Looks around room. He succeeded. I ran to my apartments, placed some manuscript paper, a dozen sandwiches, and my slippers in a suitcase, grabbed my faithful typewriting machine, just made the train, and here you see me, ready to win or lose the wager, as the case may be. What do you think of that, mother? Mrs. Quimby to McGee. I never heard of such a thing. Here is a copy of the agreement in which you will notice your name is mentioned, Mr. Quimby. Listen. Reads. You are to leave New York City on the 4.55 for Asquon Falls, arriving at 10.40, and go direct to Baldpate Inn, atop the Baldpate Mountain, where you will be met by my caretaker, Mr. Elijah Quimby, who, after making you comfortable, will turn over to you the key to the inn, the only key in existence. To Quimby. Is that correct? It's the only key I know of. There ain't no other key, I can swear to that. Good. Continues reading. This will ensure you against interruption, and give you the solitude necessary for concentration. You are to begin work at twelve o'clock Tuesday night, and turn over to Mr. Elijah Quimby the completed manuscript of a ten-thousand-word story of bald pate, no later than twelve o'clock Wednesday night. To Quimby. You understand? You're to turn it over to me? Precisely. What do you think of that, mother? I never heard of such a thing. You know Bentley's handwriting. There's his signature. See for yourself. Hands paper to Mrs. Quimby. Quimby's get up and read it together. McGee's takes stage. It's his writing, ain't it, Mother? Mrs. Quimby, doubtfully. Looks like it, but... Looks at McGee suspiciously. Quimby, aside. But what? Mrs. Quimby, aside. The whole thing don't sound right to me. Quimby, aside. Me neither. We better watch this cuss. Mrs. Quimby, aside. I think so, too. Quimby puts chair upright. Mrs. Quimby goes towards table left. Phone rings. Mrs. Quimby runs to foot of stairs, screaming. Quimby hugs the desk, frightened. Good Lord! Quimby, over to McGee, up center. Did you hear that? You mean the telephone? Mrs. Quimby runs to McGee. Quimby grabs McGee by the arms. Spooks! Why, that thing's been out of commission all winter. Phone continues ringing. McGee laughs. Let's get out of here, Lodge. McGee laughs. Don't be alarmed, Mrs. Quimby. I think I can explain. Bentley has just about had the service renewed. He probably wants to find out if I've arrived. Excuse me just a moment. Goes to phone and stops buzzer. Quimby's stand center, watching. Hello, hello. Yes, yes, right on time. Almost twenty minutes ago. Half frozen, thank you. Yes, he's here now, also Mrs. Quimby. Oh, we understand each other perfectly well. It's everything you said it was. The lonesomest spot on earth is right. <laughs> Laughs. You still feel that way about it, eh? Well, your opinion is going to cost you five thousand, old man. Laughs. <laughs> All right, we'll see. You want to talk to him? Just a second. To Quimby. He wants to talk to you, Mr. Quimby. Quimby goes over to phone. Is it Mr. Bentley? Yes, here you are. Sit right down. He hands Quimby receiver and goes left center, taking notes. Mrs. Quimby goes upright and listens to phone conversation while watching McGee. Quimby. In phone. Hello. Smiles as he recognizes Bentley's voice. Hello, Mr. Bentley. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I understand, sir. At twelve o'clock? Yes, sir. Oh, I'll be right here waiting. Fine, thank you, sir. We're both fine. All right, sir. Wait a minute, I'll ask him. To McGee, who is on the first landing of the stairs. He wants to know if there's anything more you want to say. McGee, on stairs, taking notes. No, just give him my regards and tell him I'm spending his money already. Quimby, in phone. He says there's nothing else, sir. Yes, sir, I understand. Goodbye, sir. Hangs up receiver and crosses to McGee. 
He wants me to be here at 12 o'clock tomorrow night to talk to him on the telephone again. McGee laughs as he goes to phone and severs connection. <laughs> and it's very sad news you'll impart to him, Mr. Quimby. I'm going to win this wager. Right. Below phone. You know, this whole thing wouldn't make a bad story in itself. Crossing to left. I'm thinking of using it for the ground plot. Points to door left. Oh, this leads to where? Goes to door of dining room left and opens it. Mrs. Quimby going over toward door. That's the dining room. Leads through to the kitchen. That door to the left goes to the cellar. Goes back to table left. Quimby looks at his watch. Aha, I see. Goes towards Quimby, right center. Have you the exact time, Mr. Quimby? Mine says half past eleven. Thirty minutes to get my bearings and frame up a character or two for a start. Crosses center to right center. Mrs. Quimby picks up suitcase and machine case from table left. Will I put these in your room? No, no, you needn't bother. Oh, it's no bother at all. Starts for the stairs. I'm only too glad to do anything for any friend of Mr. Bentley. Climbs stairs with cases and exits into room right. McGee. Up to Quimby, left center. Now you're quite sure I won't be disturbed while I'm writing. Quimby, left center. Who's going to disturb you here? No one ever comes within a mile of this place till around the first of April except myself, and I only come up about once a week this kind of weather. You don't suppose any of Bentley's Ascalon friends hearing of the wager would take it upon themselves to interrupt the progress of my work? Nobody knows you're here except me and the missus, and we ain't going to tell no one. I have your word for that. Offers his hand to Quimby. Quimby takes McGee's hand. I never broke my word in my life. Guess that's why I'm a poor man. McGee crosses to right center. The only other time I remember of anybody coming here in the winter was the time of that reform wave at Wrighton. The reformers got after a lot of crooked politicians and they broke in here in the middle of the night and hid a lot of graft money in that safe over there. Points to safe. McGee goes up to safe, opens the door, then comes down to Quimby after closing safe door. You mean to tell me the reformers hid money in that safe? No, the politicians. Reformers never have any money. McGee laughs as he goes right. <laughs> Splendid. What are you laughing at? McGee, turning back to Quimby. Nothing, it's all right. Go on, tell me about the hidden graft. Quimby. Mrs. Quimby starts downstairs, bringing lantern and placing it on table left. Oh, there's nothing much to tell. Some fellers up and gave him away, and the police come the next morning and found it here. Nobody claimed it, so of course they never got the gang. They threw a lot of fellers out of office, I believe. I didn't read much about it, but that's over four years ago. You needn't be afraid, you won't be disturbed here. Goes left to table and gets his mittens and cap. Mrs. Quimby is at table, putting on mittens, etc. McGee going slightly right. Grafting, politicians, reformers, hidden money. Sounds like a good seller. Mrs. Quimby goes to McGee at center. Quimby takes lantern and goes back of table. Is there anything more we can do for you, Mr. McGee? No, no, nothing I can think of, thank you. I'll be quite... Crossing to Quimby at table. Mrs. Quimby goes to right center. Oh, yes, of course. You've forgotten something, Mr. Quimby. Forgot what? The key. Oh, Lord, yes, the key. Here it is. Hands McGee the key. You're positively certain that this key is the only key to Baldpate in existence? Yes, sir, I'm sure. I can swear to it. Good. What are you going to do, lock yourself in? Precisely. I don't mind staying here and keeping watch for you if you want me to. No, thanks. I'd much prefer to be alone. I'd rather it would be you than me. Lord, I should think you'd be afraid of ghosts. Quimby crosses to Mrs. Quimby. Mother, I've told you twenty times there ain't no such a thing. McGee goes up left. Well, they've been seen here, just the same. McGee goes left center to Quimby's. Ghosts? Oh, don't mind her, Mr. McGee. We think we know what the ghost is. There's an old fellow up here in the mountains by the name of Peters. He's a hermit. A hermit? Yes, he's one of them fellows that's been disappointed in love. His wife ran off with a traveling man. He come here about ten years ago. Lives in a little shack about a mile and a half north of here. Calls it the Hermit's Cave. All the summer boarders buy picture postcards from him. We figure he's the fellow that's been frightening the people down in the valley by waving a lantern from the mountainside with a white sheet wrapped around him. But no one ever proved it was him. Well, who else could it be? There ain't no such thing as ghosts, is there, Mr. McGee? 
Well, I hope not. Muses. By play between the Quimbies. Ghosts, hermits, not bad at all. Well, come along, Mother. I guess maybe Mr. McGee is anxious to get to work. I'll say good night, sir. Offers hand to McGee. McGee shakes Quimby's hand. Good night. And remember, twelve o'clock sharp for Mr. Bentley's phone call tomorrow night. I'll be here on the minute. Goes up center, Mrs. Quimby, shaking hands with McGee. And I'm coming to see if you're still alive. Lord, I should think you'd be scared to death. Quimby comes down left of McGee. Mother, he will be if you keep on like that. Well, good night, sir, and good luck. Goes up towards door, followed by Mrs. Quimby. McGee goes up to door and unlocks it. Good night. I don't envy you your trip down the mountain on a night like this. Opens door. Wind effect. Good night, sir. Starts through door, followed by Quimby, carrying lantern. Good night, Mrs. Quimby. Keep a sharp lookout for ghosts and hermits. <laughs>, Laughs. Mrs. Quimby, outside. Lord, don't remind me, please. McGee slams door quickly, locks it, waves his hand to the Quimbys, then starts looking at Key in his hand. The only one, eh? <laughs> we'll see. Puts Key in his pocket, looks round the room, thinks, then claps his hand as if decided on something, grabs his coat and hat from chair near fire, extinguishes lamps and brackets lights, takes a last look around the room, then exits upstairs into room right on balcony. Black drop down for ten seconds. End of prologue. Act One of Seven Keys to Baldpate by George M. Cohen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Drop up for Act One. The clock strikes twelve. The sound of a typewriter is heard clicking from room occupied by McGee. A short pause of absolute silence. Then Bland appears at door, peering into room. Bland. Opens door, enters. Locks door, then comes down to center. Looks about, rubbing his hands and blowing on them to warm them. Sees safe, goes up to it, tries the door, opens it, and goes around right. As he starts for phone, he sees fire burning and stops dead. A log fire! Who hey, the devil built that? Thinks, snaps fingers, <coughs> goes to phone and puts in plug. 2875 West. Hurry it along, sister. McGee enters from room and stands on balcony, listening, leaving door of room opening. In phone. Hello? Is that you, Andy? This is bland. Yes, bald pate. Yes, damn near frozen. Oh, awful. It's like Napoleon's tomb. I thought you said Mayor Cargan would meet me here. No, no, I can't stay here all night. I'd go mad. Listen. I'll hide the money here in the safe and meet him at nine o'clock in the morning and turn it over to him then. There isn't a chance in the world of anything happening. The money's safer here than any spot on earth. I'll lock the safe as soon as I put the package in. Meg Cargan knows the combination. My advice is to let it lay here a week. It's the last place I'll look for it. Besides, how could they get in? My key to Baldpate is the only one in existence. McGee, on balcony, takes out his key and looks at it. They don't figure we take the chance after the other exposure. 
I'll tell you, I know best. I'll be back in town by one o'clock. I've got the president's machine waiting at the foot of the mountain. All right, goodbye. Hangs up receiver, goes center. Takes package of money from his pocket, looks at it, and around room, then goes to safe and deposits the money therein. McGee starts slowly and stealthily downstairs. Bland closes door of safe, turns the handle, tries doors to see if they are locked securely, then comes down to fireplace and warms himself. As he turns his back to the fire, he comes face to face with McGee, who by this time is standing right. Bland's hand goes to his pocket for his gun, as he comes slowly center to McGee. McGee, cool and collected. Good evening, or perhaps I should say good morning. Bland, keeping his hand on his gun as he advances towards McGee. Who are you? I was just about to put that question to you. What are you doing here? I rather think I'm the one entitled to an explanation. Did you follow me up that mountain? Oh no, I was here an hour ahead of you. How'd you get in here? McGee points. Through that door. You lie. There's only one key to that door, and I have it right here in my pocket. My dear sir, I was laboring under that same impression until a moment ago. But as your key fits the lock, and my key fits the lock, there are evidently two keys to Baldpate instead of one. He shows Bland his key. See? You mean to tell me that's a key to Baldpate? Yes. That's why I became so interested in your arrival here. I heard you telephone your friend just now and declare that your key was the only one in existence. <laughs> Laughs. <laughs> it sort of handed me a laugh. You heard what I said over the telephone? Every word. Bland. Pulls pistol. You don't think you're going to live to tell it, do you? Have no fear on that score. I'm not a tattletale, nor do I intend to pry into affairs that do not concern me. But I should like your answering me one question. Where did you get your key to Baldpate? None of your damn business. I didn't come here to tell you the story of my life. Well, you might at least relate that portion of it that has led you to trespassing on a gentleman seeking seclusion. Trespassing, eh? Who's trespassing? You or I? My right here is indisputable. Who gave you that key? None of your damned business. If I remember rightly, that's the answer you gave me. Bland goes slightly nearer McGee. You've got a pretty good nerve to talk like that, with a gun in front of your face. Oh, that doesn't disturb me in the least. While I have never experienced this sort of thing in real life before, I've written so much of this melodramatic stuff and collected such splendid royalties from it all that it rather amuses me to discover that the so-called literary trash is the real thing, after all. You may not believe it, but really, old chap, I've written you over and over. <laughs> laughs hardly and slaps Bland on the shoulder. The latter backs away after a second slap. McGee sits at table, still laughing heartily. Bland, up close to McGee. Say, I killed a man once for laughing at me. That's my line. I used it in the lost limousine. Four hundred thousand copies. I'll bet you've read it. Bland, pointing gun. If you don't tell me who you are and what you're doing here, I'll kill you as dead as a doornail. Come on, I mean business. Who are you? Well, a name doesn't mean so much, so you may call me Mr. Smith. What are you? A writer of popular novels. What are you doing here? trying to win a bet by completing a story of Baldpate in 24 hours. Gets up. 
A few more interruptions of this sort, however, and it's plain to be seen I'll pay the winner. Up close to Bland. You can do me a big favor, old man, by leaving this place to myself for the night. I give you my word of honor that whatever I've seen or heard shall remain absolutely sacred. Bland, sneeringly. Ye must think I'm an awful fool to swallow that kind of talk. Very well. If you don't believe I'm who I say I am, and you doubt that I'm here for the reason I gave, go upstairs to that room with the open door. Points to room right on balcony. Bland looks up and backs away. And you'll find a typewriting machine, several pages of manuscripts scattered about the floor, and a letter on the dresser from the owner of this inn to the caretaker proving conclusively that all I've told you is the truth and nothing but the truth, and there you are. Bland, up close to McGee. And you're not in with the police? No. I wish I were, if the graft is as good as they say it is. You say you have a letter from the owner of the inn? Yes. Wait a minute and I'll get it for you. Starts upstairs, but is stopped by Bland as he is about halfway up. Bland shouts, Come back! McGee comes down and goes left center. What's the matter? Bland, going left center to McGee. I've been double-crossed before, young fellow. I'll find it if it's there. Oh, very well. If you prefer to get it for yourself, why, well, go right along. He turns from Bland. As he does so, Bland fans him for a gun. McGee turns, surprised. Then, as he understands, he laughs. <laughs> you needn't be alarmed. I never carried a gun in my life. But you keep one in your room, eh? If you think so, search the room. That's just what I'm going to do. I guess I'll keep you in sight, though. Go on. I'll let you show me the way. All right. Starts towards stairs. If that's the way you feel about it, why, certainly. Goes upstairs leisurely, followed by Bland, who keeps him covered. McGee starts to exit into room. Bland stops him. Bland, center of balcony. Wait a minute. I'll peek round that room alone first. You don't look good to me. You're too damn willing. Goes to door of room right. McGee steps out to right of door. You wait out there. I'll call you when I've satisfied myself. You're not trying to spring something. Very well. If you don't trust me, go ahead. Bland exit into room, keeping his eye fixed on McGee. The latter stands thinking for a moment, then turns and slams the door quickly, locks it, and runs downstairs to phone. When he is halfway down, Bland starts hammering on door. Bland, yelling and hammering on door. Open this door! Hammers. Damn you, I'll get you for this. McGee, at phone. Hello, I want to talk to the Ascoan Police Headquarters. That's what I said, Police Headquarters. Bland pounds on door. As McGee sits waiting for connection, Mary Norton appears at door. She unlocks it and enters, closing door. The cold blast of wind attracts McGee, who jumps up and yells. Who's there? What do you want? Don't shoot. It's all right. I'm harmless. How did you open that door? Mary, slightly down towards McGee. Unlocked it with a key, of course. McGee, half aside. My God. Mary comes towards McGee. If you will allow me to bring my chaperone inside, I will explain in a moment who I am and why we're here. Your chaperone? Mary, going up to door. Yes. Another perfectly harmless female who has been kind enough to accompany me on this wild adventure. Turns to McGee. I have your permission. McGee looks up at room right, then back at Mary, puzzled. Say, what the deuce is this all about? You'll soon know. 
opens door and calls. All right, Mrs. Rhodes. Mrs. Rhodes screams off stage, then enters and runs past Mary to above table left, terribly frightened. What's the matter? What's happened? Mrs. Rhodes shouting to Mary. Lock the door! Lock the door! Mary hurriedly locks door. McGee crosses to Mrs. Rhodes, speaking hurriedly. Tell me, please, what is it? Mary runs down left to Mrs. Rhodes. What frightened you, Mrs. Rhodes? Mrs. Rhodes, almost hysterical. <gasps> A man! A man? What man? I don't know! He appeared at the window above, flourishing a revolver, and then he jumped to the ground and started running down the mountainside. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Just a moment. Turns and darts upstairs, taking key from his pocket as he goes. Mary going right center with Mrs. Rhodes. Is there anything wrong? I'm beginning to think I am. Opens door right on balcony and exits. Mrs. Rhodes still hysterical. Why did you ever come here? Mary coolly. It's all right. Don't get excited. McGee enters room right and comes to center a balcony. The bird has flown, but he forgot this when he took the jump. Points gun at women. Mrs. Rhodes runs right, screaming. Mary screams and runs left. Don't be alarmed. I'm not going to shoot. At least, not yet. Is on landing of stairs as he speaks next line. Now, might I ask why I'm so honored by this midnight visit? Snaps on bracket lights and comes down center. Mary goes left center to McGee. I can explain in a very few words. That will suit me immensely. My time is valuable. I'm losing thousands of dollars, perhaps, through even this waste of time. Looks at Mary intently. Be as brief as possible, please. I... Stares at her. Why do you stare at me so? Do you believe in love at first sight? Mrs. Rhodes takes a step towards them, surprised. What do you mean? You know, I've written about it a great many times, but I never believed in it before. It's really remarkable. Looks from Mary to Mrs. Rhodes, puzzled, then laughs in an embarrassed manner. Oh, pardon me, you were about to explain your visit here. Well, to begin with, I... Phone rings. All turn and look at it. McGee goes to phone, stops buzzer, then backs upstage center. Mrs. Rhodes is right center. To Mary. Will you be kind enough to answer that phone? I don't care to turn my back on anything but a bolted door tonight. As Mary looks surprised. If you please. Certainly. Goes to phone. Mrs. Rhodes goes right center above Mary. Hello? What's that? Hold the wire, please. I'll see. Turns to McGee. Did you wish to talk to police headquarters? Mrs. Rhodes goes to McGee center, frightened. <gasps> police headquarters? McGee, crossing Mrs. Rhodes, who goes over to right of table left. Yes. Starts, then stops, and looks up at room right on balcony. But, no, just say they must have made a mistake. Backs upstage center. Mary, in phone. Hello? No. No such call put in from here. Must be some mistake. That's all right. Stands up receiver and goes left. McGee goes to phone, severs connection, then comes down center. Mary, up to him. Then you did call police headquarters? I did. Mrs. Rhodes goes to center. Why did you call police headquarters? Yes, why did you call police headquarters? McGee looks at both, puzzled, then laughs. <laughs> You know, these are the most remarkable lot of happenings. No sooner do I get rid of one bestseller than along comes another dyed in the wool to be continued in our next. To Mary. You know, there's no particular reason for my saying this, but I really believe I'd do anything in the world for you. I don't understand. But you promised to explain your presence here. Which I fully intend to do. But first of all, I should like to ask you one question. 
proceed. How did you get in here without this key? Shows him her key. McGee laughs. <laughs> oh, no, no. Laughs. <laughs> you know, I'm beginning to think this whole thing is a frame-up. What do you mean? McGee points to her key. You have the only key to bald pate in existence, I suppose. So I understood. Well, if it's any news to you ladies, believe me, there are more keys to bald pate than you'll find in a Steinway piano. Then he lied. Who lied? Mrs. Rhodes, quickly. Remember your promise, Mary. Crosses to chair in front of fire and sits. McGee follows Mrs. Rhodes with his eyes, making complete turn. Well? I can't tell you his name. Well, at least tell me your name. My name is Mary Norton. I do special stories for the Root and Star. McGee, surprised. In the newspaper game? That's it. And this lady? Pointing to Mrs. Rhodes, who is now removing her rubbers. Is Mrs. Rhodes, with whom I live in Rooten, and who is the only other person who knows I'm here to do this story. What story? The story of the $5,000 wager you have made with a certain gentleman, that you would write a complete novel inside of 24 hours. Who told you this? Remember your promise, Mary. McGee crosses to right center. Mary goes left center. McGee looks at Mrs. Rhodes and then at Mary. You've made many a promise, haven't you, Mary? I should certainly like to know who gave you this information. Mary goes to McGee, right center. I can tell you only that when the wager was made at the 44th Street Club this afternoon, a certain someone dispatched the news to me at once. Believing that I had the only key to Baldpate, I hurried here to let you in, and lo and behold... Takes stage left. McGee, following her... I find you already at work, and as snug and cozy as you would be in a New York apartment. Comes down right of table. McGee, following her. Now that you know my story, I am going to throw myself on your mercy, and ask you to allow me to stay here and get the beat. I promise you we shall not disturb you in the least. Have you any objections? And you won't tell me who gave you the story? I can't. Nor where you got the key? Remember your promise, Mary. McGee. Turns and looks at Mrs. Rhodes, and then at Mary. You know, I wish you hadn't brought her with you. What? Gets up and starts left towards McGee. McGee goes towards her as she starts up. No offense, Mrs. Rhodes. Of course, I understand that Mary is a very promising young woman. But why continually remind her of the fact? Laughs apologetically. <laughs> That's just my little joke. Excuse me. Goes to Mary Center. Mrs. Rhodes goes to window, looking out. Let me get this clear. Your idea is to stop here and write the story of my 24-hour task. With your permission. Well, I'll tell you. Had you put such a proposition up to me... Mrs. Rhodes comes down stage to right center. Half an hour ago, I should have said emphatically no. But since my little experience with the gun-flourishing, window-jumping gentleman, I'm inclined to entertain the idea of a companion or two. Mrs. Rhodes, right of McGee. Who was the man with the gun? Why did he jump from the window? You might as well ask me why he placed a package of money in that safe. Mary and Mrs. Rhodes go up towards safe. Or why he telephoned the fact to someone else who was to pass the word along to Mayor Cargan. Mrs. Rhodes... Turns to McGee, amazed. Mayor Cargan! What seems to be the trouble? Mary. To McGee, center. Mrs. Rhodes is a widow. Mayor Cargan a widower. Perhaps you will understand why the name startled her when I tell you that Mrs. Rhodes is to become Mrs. Cargan next Sunday morning. Oh, indeed. Mary goes up center, then down again during next speech. McGee crosses to Mrs. Rhodes. Well, congratulations, Mrs. Rhodes. And again, I say I did not mean to offend. I'm not accusing Mayor Cargan of any transaction, dishonest or otherwise. I was merely trying to point out to you ladies that it has been a night of wild occurrences up to now. However, if you care to take the risk, stay here. It won't disturb me in the least, and may possibly benefit this young lady in her business. Goes towards Mary, 
looks at his watch and whistles. I've lost half an hour already, and as every minute means money to me right now, I'll have to work fast to make up for the time I've lost. To Mrs. Rhodes. Mary comes down left center. Again, I apologize for any mistake I may have made, Mrs. Rhodes. I assure you, a more honest man than Jim Cargan never lived. I sincerely trust you're right, especially for your own sake. Mrs. Rhodes sits in front of fire. McGee goes to Mary and takes her hand. I hope the story proves a whale. I wish... What do you wish? Oh, nothing. I was just thinking of Sunday morning. Good night. Good night. McGee, as he goes up the stairs. I'd gladly offer you ladies my room, but it's the only one cleaned and heated, and I must have some comfort for this kind of work. On balcony right. Good night, ladies. Good Good night. night. McGee, leaning over balcony. Mary, that's the sweetest name in the world. Mary, looking up at him. Thank you. Good night. Good night. McGee, a long look at Mary, and then at Mrs. Rhodes. I still wish you hadn't brought her with you. Good night. Good night. McGee exits into room right on balcony, closing door. Mrs. Rhodes, over to Mary, right center. You don't believe Jim Cargan guilty of any treachery? Tell me you don't, Mary. I don't know, Mrs. Rhodes. I told you of the suburban bribe story we got last night, but I certainly hope the name of Cargan is kept clean, for both your sakes. I can't believe he's wrong. I won't believe it. Crosses to left center. Mary, following Mrs. Rhodes. But if he is wrong, it's best you should know it now. The fates may have brought us here tonight to protect you. Who knows? Mrs. Rhodes, going towards safe. Money hidden in that safe, he said. Yes, and that dovetails with the suburban bribe story. Both come down stage a trifle. I came down here to do a special. I may get two sweeps with the one broom. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'd be made. Mrs. Rhodes turns upstage, looks towards door, and sees Peters. (gasps) Great heavens, Mary, look! What is it? Looks up at door, sees Peters, screams, and runs left behind Bannister. Mrs. Rhodes screams and runs right, hides behind chair. McGee enters on balcony after second scream. McGee, looking down on women. What's wrong down there? A ghost! What? A ghost! A ghost! McGee, laughing. (laughs) I'll bet you four dollars that's the fellow whose wife ran away with a traveling man. Starts to come downstairs. Mary and Mrs. Rhodes. They wave McGee back. Shh! McGee snaps out lights. Peters unlocks the door, enters, locks the door, then throws the sheet over his arm and comes down stage, looking from Mary to Mrs. Rhodes, who both come forward a trifle. McGee comes to left of Peters at center. I beg your pardon, but have you any idea just how many keys there are to this flat? Peters. Ignores question. What are these women doing here? How's that? I don't like women. Mrs. Rhodes and Mary scream and run to the foot of stairs. <laughs> it's all right, ladies. He's not a regular ghost. I know all about him. He's in the picture postcard business. Peters, gruffly. What? McGee, to Peters. Just a minute, Bosco. Two ladies. If you ladies will kindly step upstairs into my room, I'll either kill it or cure it. Ladies go up and stand on balcony. Peters, gruffly. What? McGee, to Peters. See here, that's the second time you've barked at me. Now don't do it again, do you hear? To ladies. Go right in, ladies. They exit into room right, closing door. McGee, down to Peters. So you're the ghost of Baldpate, are you? How do you people get in here? McGee laughs. (laughs) You're not going to pull that only key in existence speech on me, are you? What? You know there are other keys besides yours. They're all imitations. Mine's the real key. 
The old man gave it to me the day before he died. What old man? The father of that young scamp who wastes his time around those New York clubs. You know who I mean. Then you're not particularly fond of the present owner of Baldpate? I hate him and all his men friends. You don't like women either, you say? I despise them. How do little girls and boys strike you? Bah. McGee laughs. <laughs> I can understand your wife now. Anything in preference to you, even a traveling man. Don't mention my wife's name or I'll... Raises lantern to strike McGee. McGee pulls lantern out of Peter's hand. Now see here, old man, if you make any more bluffs at me, I'll take that white sheet away from you and put you right out of the ghost business. Haven't you any better sense than to go about frightening little children this way? Why don't you stick to your own line of work? You're a hermit by trade, if I'm rightly informed. Yeah, I'm a hermit. I'm proud of it. Then why don't you cut out this ghost stuff and be a regular hermit? I play the ghost because I love to see the cowards run. Oh, they're all cowards, is that it? Cowards, yes. <laughs>, Laughs gruffly. And you're a brave man, I suppose. A caveman is always a brave man. Pistol shots are heard outside. Then, woman scream. Peters laughs and dances up to the door and peers through. Aha, they're shooting again. They're shooting again. Mary and Mrs. Rhodes have come out on the balcony at shots. McGee up to door and peers through. What's that? What's happened? Is someone hurt? Both lean over balcony, looking down. Did you hear a woman scream? Mary, frightened. Distinctly. Mrs. Rhodes, frightened. And a pistol shot! Peters, dramatically, as he goes towards door left, slowly. A woman in white! A woman in white! They shot at her as they shoot at me when I play the ghost. Laughs. They thought it was the ghost. Almost whispers. Thought it was the ghost. Laughs viciously and exits door left. Myra Thornhill appears at door center and is seen unlocking it. McGee runs to foot of stairs and calls up to the women. My God, another key. What? Shh, it's a woman. He waves them back. Shh. Mary and Mrs. Rhodes go back into room right. McGee crouches behind Bannister, unseen by Myra, until he speaks. Myra enters, locks doors, then tiptoes cautiously to dead center. She takes a sweeping glance around, then goes to fire and warms herself, comes to center again, and on making sure that no one is in the room, she goes to safe and starts working combination, first picking up lantern from desk and holding it in her left hand, while working combination with her right. McGee, snapping on bracket lights. I thought I'd give you a little more light so you could work faster. Myra puts lantern on desk and throws up her hands. You needn't throw up your hands. I'll take a chance on that quick stuff. Come on out here, please. Laughs. As Myra comes around desk right to center slowly. I didn't think they did that sort of thing outside of melodrama and popular novels, but I see I was wrong, or I should say right, when I wrote it. Myra continues to advance to him slowly. Really, you're the most attractive burglar I've ever seen. That is, if you are a burglar. Are you? Myra, coolly. Are you one of the Cargan crowd, or do you represent the Royton suburban people? Mary and Mrs. Rhodes enter on balcony and listen. No, I'm just an ordinary man trying to win a bet. But up to now, the chances have been dead against me. Perhaps you'd like to tell me who you are. I will, if you'll answer me one question. McGee laughs. <laughs> of course, of course, I'll answer that one before you ask it. A friend of mine gave it to me. Of course, you thought you had the only one in existence, but he lied to you. I have a cute little key of my own. Oh, there are keys and keys, but I love my little key best of all. Shows her his key, 
kissing it. See? I can't understand it at all. You haven't anything on me. And just about two more keys, and I'll pack up my paraphernalia, go back to New York, and never make another bet as long as I live. Myra, up close to him. Will you please tell me your name? Well, a name doesn't mean so much, so you may call me Mr. Jones. And yours? My name is... Hesitates. Mary? And Mrs. Rhodes lean over a balcony, listening. Listen. Brings McGee downstage. My husband is the president of the Skewan Royton Suburban Railway Company. He has agreed to pay a vast amount of money for a certain city franchise, a franchise that the political crowd at Royton has no power to grant. They are going to cheat him out of this money and use it for campaign funds to fight the opposition party at the next election. If he sues for his money back, they are going to expose him for entering into an agreement he knows to be nothing short of bribery. The present mayor is at the bottom of it all. Mary and Mrs. Rhodes start at the mention of mayor's name. I ran to my husband tonight and begged him not to enter into this deal. I warned him that he was being cheated. He wouldn't believe me, but I know it's true. He's being cheated and will be charged with bribery besides. That's why I risked the mountain on a night like this. I must have been followed, for I was shot at as I reached the top of Baldpate. Oh, I don't know who you are, but you're a man and you can help me. Puts her hands on his shoulders pleadingly. You will help me, won't you? McGee, interested. Yes. What do you want me to do? Myra looks at McGee for a moment without speaking, then goes up to safe and back to McGee. In that safe, there is a package containing $200,000. McGee goes up towards safe. $200,000. Mary and Mrs. Rhodes start downstairs very slowly. Myra following McGee upright. That's the amount. It must be there. A man named Bland was to bring it here and deposit it at midnight. Cargan was to follow later and was to find it here. McGee, coming down stage. Cargan coming here. So they've planned it. I must have that money out of there before he arrives. You'll help me, won't you? Don't you understand? My husband is being cheated, tricked, robbed, probably ruined. But I don't know the combination. Myra, wringing her hands. Oh, there must be something we can do. Please, please. She kneels at his feet and puts up her hands imploringly. For the sake of my children, help me, please. McGee sees women on stairs and warns Myra with a look as he helps her to her feet. She turns and faces Mary and Mrs. Rhodes, then turns abruptly to McGee. Who are these women? What are they doing here? She has changed from hysteria to dignified coldness. Oh, of course, pardon me. Goes to women at foot of stairs. Myra crosses to right. May I introduce Miss... Myra cuts him off sharply. Please don't. Turns to women... Will you pardon me for a moment, ladies? Certainly. They step off stairs and remain left, keeping their eyes fixed on Myra and McGee. McGee goes right to Myra. Myra, aside to McGee. For God's sake, don't tell them who I am. My husband will kill me if he ever learns that I've been here on such an errand. McGee, aside. I understand. You may trust me. I sympathize with you very deeply, madam, and I promise you that no one shall take that money away from here tonight unless it be yourself. And I'll get it out of that safe if I have to blow the thing to smithereens. You give me your word as a gentleman. McGee offers his hand. My word as a gentleman. Myra takes his hand. Thank you. McGee pulls down his vest and goes up to Mary and Mrs. Rhodes. Ladies, I wish to present a girl schoolmate of mine, Miss Brown, who has become interested enough in my career to find her way to Bald Pate to witness my endeavor to break all records as a speedy story writer. Miss Brown? 
Both bow. Myra returns the bow. McGee takes out his watch and looks at it. Up to now, I'm almost an hour behind myself. However, I expect to catch up with myself before the night is over. That is, of course, providing there aren't over three hundred more keys to the old front door. Mary goes up to McGee Center. Now, might I have a word with you alone? I'd be delighted. I'd like to be alone with you forever. Mary, to Myra. Will you pardon me for a moment? Certainly. Go right upstairs, Miss Brown, and make yourself quite at home. Starts towards stairs with Myra. Oh, Mrs. Rhodes, will you be good enough to show her to the room? Mary crosses center to right. I'm sure she needs a little drop of something after that bitter cold trip up the mountain. You'll find a flask on the table. Mrs. Rhodes starts up the stairs. Come right along, miss. I know where it is. I've already tried it. Exit room right. Myra, following Mrs. Rhodes, upstairs. Well, really, I don't know what to say to all this kindness. I... Stops center on balcony, looks down, and warns McGee to silence with finger on her lips. He reassures her, then goes center. Mrs. Rhodes, appearing at door. Right in here, miss. Thanks, awfully. Exit into room, followed by Mrs. Rhodes who closes door. Mary goes quickly to McGee at center. Who did that woman claim to be? That's a secret I've promised never to reveal. But I overheard everything she said. Then you know. I know she lied. She lied? She claimed to be the wife of Thomas Hayden, president of the Suburban Railway. She lied, I tell you. Why, I've known Mrs. Hayden all my life was brought up and went to school with her daughters. Mrs. Hayden is a woman in her fifties. You can see for yourself that she is nothing more than a slip of a girl. There's a mystery here of some kind. Someone's playing a desperate game. Goes upstage excitedly, looking up at door right. Yes, and it's costing me $5,000. I'll never get my work done tonight. I can see that right now. Looks at watch. Mary comes down center. But what do I care? I've met you. You're going to give this money over to that woman? Peters enters from left and hides behind banisters. Not if she lied. Well, you believe me, don't you? McGee takes her hand. Believe you? Let me tell you something, little girl. I've written a lot of those Romeo speeches in my novels, though I never really felt this way before, but here goes. The moment you walked through that door tonight and I laid eyes on you, I made up my mind that you were the one woman in the world for me. Why, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. Try me. Very well, I shall. Get me that package of money out of that safe before Cargan comes to steal it. Help me to reach Rutan without being molested, and I'll annihilate the graft machine with tomorrow's edition of the Star. With that money to turn over to the proper authorities as proof of the deal— I'll wipe out the streetcar trust and the Cargan crowd with one swing of the pen. And just think, I'll save Mrs. Rhodes from an alliance with a thief. I know Cargan's crooked, always has been, but I must prove it before she'll break off the engagement. Great Scott, what a story I'll write. Think what it will mean to me and to the city of Rutan itself. Puts her hands on his shoulders pleadingly. You will do this for me, won't you? Please. Please. Yes. What do you want me to do? Come, we must hurry. Can't you think of some way to open that safe? Goes up towards safe, McGee following. He comes down center. What are we going to do? We don't know the combination, and I haven't any dynamite. But we must have that two hundred thousand dollars. Peters moves chair just enough to betray his presence. Mary comes down to McGee, frightened placing her hand on his arm. What was that? Oh, that was nothing. It was just the wind creeping through the cracks, I fancy. Aside. Go upstairs. There's someone hiding in this room. Aloud. Good night, Miss Norton. Good night. She hurries upstairs and exits into room right. McGee looks around room for a moment, reaches over banisters and snaps out lights. Starts whistling and then goes upstairs to left room on balcony, 
opens doors, slams it loudly, and then comes out and sits behind banisters, watching Peters. Peters makes sure no one is in sight, then goes quickly over to safe and starts working combination quietly but hurriedly. McGee watching him from stairs. Cargan and Max appear outside, peering through into room. As the safe door flies open, they enter quickly, Cargan opening the door. Max enters and goes quickly up center and covers Peters with gun. Cargan closes door and goes quickly to Peters. Get away from that safe. Peters jumps away. Put up your hands. Peter's hands go up. Cargan recognizes him as he goes towards safe. Oh, it's you, is it? To Max. The ghost came near walking that time for fair. To Peter's. Come out of there. Peter's comes in front of desk. How did you know the combination of that safe? No reply from Peter's. Who told you there was money in there? No reply from Peter's. Get out of here, you vagabond. Throws Peters towards left. What do you mean by breaking into a man's safe in the middle of the night? Throw him in the cellar, Max. Come on, hurry up. Get out. Throws Peters left. Peters at door left. Damn you, Cargan. I hate you. Get out. Goes up and locks door. Go on, get out. Peters exit left door. Max follows him off and returns almost immediately. Cargan goes to safe and gets package of money. Max enters. By gad, we weren't any too soon. Goes to table left. Another moment and he'd have had it sure. It would be goodbye to the hermit if he ever got hold of a roll like this. Flips bills in his hands. Two hundred one thousand dollar bills. Is it all there? I don't know. I'll see. McGee comes downstairs and goes behind desk while Max and Cargan are counting money. You seem surprised that I found the money here. What do you mean, surprised? Cargan rises, puts money in his pocket, then comes in front of the table. Max comes forward and stands left of Cargan, below table. I'm going to tell you something, Max. I didn't trust you all day, and I didn't trust you tonight. What do you mean you didn't trust me? I'll be truthful with you. I thought you were going to double-cross me. I thought you were going to beat me to the bankroll through this woman, Thornhill. Myra Thornhill? Yes, Myra Thornhill. Oh, don't play dead. You knew she was around. You've had secret meetings with her during the last forty-eight hours. I know every move you've made. I've had you watched. You've worked with her before. As Max makes a motion of protest. You've told me so. I had my mind made up to kill you, Max, if this money had been gone. And that's just what I'm going to do if you ever double-cross me. Do you understand? Max, in a hangdog tone. Yes, I understand. McGee, who has been crouching between safe and desk, now stands up, takes aim, and fires at left wall, then rushes over and turns on bracket lights. At the sound of the shot, the women come out on balcony, frightened, and stand looking down at men. Cargan, as McGee shoots. My God, I'm shot! Reels against table. Max draws back left. McGee comes down right center. No, you're not. I just put a bullet into the wall, and I'll put one in you if you don't toss that package of money over here. Come on, hurry up. I mean business. Cargan hesitates, then throws money to McGee, right center. The latter picks it up and puts it in his pocket. You see, being a writer of sensational novels, I'm well up in this melodramatic stuff. Mrs. Rhodes, on balcony, watching Cargan. Jim Cargan! Cargan, 
He and Max look up and see women on balcony. What are you doing here? Mrs. Rhodes doesn't reply, but continues staring at him. Myra, looking down at Max. Max, Max, are you hurt? No, I'm all right. Cargan, turning slowly to Max. Myra Thornhill, eh? So you were trying to cross me. You snake. Chokes Max. Women scream. I must insist on orderly conduct, gentlemen. No roughhouse, please. To Max. Young man, be good enough to put that gun of yours on the table. Max hesitates. Hurry now. Max does as directed. Now kindly remove that gun from Mr. Cargan's pocket, I'm sure he has one, and put it on the table also. He might want to take a shot at you, and I'm giving you the necessary protection. Hurry, please. Max takes Cargan's gun and places it on table. Now, Mrs. Rhodes, will you kindly ask the streetcar president's wife to step back into that room, then lock the door and remove the key? Myra goes slowly to room right. Mrs. Rhodes follows her, locks the door, then comes to center of balcony. Thank you. And now, Miss Norton, will you kindly step down here? Mary starts downstairs and hangs Muff on chair left. And take those two revolvers from the table and place them in the hotel safe, and then close the safe and turn the combination? Mary places guns in safe, turns combination, and remains up near desk. Thank you very much. To men. Now, gentlemen, I must insist that you step upstairs to the room on the right of the balcony. And, Mrs. Rhodes, will you please step over there and lock the door when these gentlemen are on the other side? Mrs. Rhodes crosses balcony, goes to room left, unlocks doors, and stands aside for the men to pass in. I shan't keep you there long, gentlemen. I'll release you as soon as I've transacted some important business with this young lady. Lively now, gentlemen, lively. As men start upstairs slowly. That's it. Now to your right. Correct. Now straight ahead. Max exits into room. Cargan stops as he gets to door and turns and looks appealingly at Mrs. Rhodes, who ignores his outstretched hands. Now right in. Cargan exits into room left. Lock the door, Mrs. Rhodes, and bring the keys down to me. Mrs. Rhodes locks doors and brings keys to McGee at center. That's the ticket. Thanks very much. Mary comes to center. Well, how's my work? Some roundup, wasn't it? To Mrs. Rhodes. I'm awfully sorry about this for your sake, Mrs. Rhodes. Mary, to McGee, right of him. It's best she should know. To Mrs. Rhodes, extending her hand. Isn't it, dear? Mrs. Rhodes, going right center, after taking Mary's hand. I suppose so, dear. I suppose so. Well, come on, little girl. You've got to work fast. Here's the graft money. Takes money from his pocket and gives it to Mary. Now what? I've everything planned. I know just what I'm going to do. What's the time? McGee, looking at watch. One thirty. But you can't get a train out of Ascawan until five. Mary crosses left, gets muff, and places money in it. We can't sit around the station for three hours, dear. Mary returns left center to McGee. Try to get a taxi or whatever sort of conveyance they have in the darn town. But whatever you do, get out of Ascawan as soon as you can. You leave it to me. I'll find a way. Are you going to stay here? McGee looks up at room right and left. I'll have to. I want to keep guard on this crowd of lady and gentleman bandits until I'm sure you're well on your way. I'll keep them here until you phone and tell me you're out of danger, even though it's all night tonight and all day tomorrow. But your work... Never mind the work. I can write a novel any old time. So far as the bet is concerned, I can lose that and still be repaid a million times over. I've met you. Takes her hand, then crosses to Mrs. Rhodes. Mary goes up center. Good night, Mrs. Rhodes, and God bless you both. Good night. Shakes hands with McGee, then starts for door and stands looking up at door left on balcony. McGee, to Mary, near door. I wonder if we'll ever meet again. I live in Rooten. Good night. Turns up near foot of stairs and looks up at door left. 
Mrs. Rhodes exits. Good night. Mary comes to door. McGee is holding open. She pauses for a moment, looks at him intently, then down at floor, then exits quickly. McGee locks door, stands peering out at them for a moment, looks up at door left, then comes down stage and stands thinking. Crooked politicians, adventurous, safe robbed, love at first sight. Points at different rooms and it's safe. And I wanted to get away from melodrama. Here's Hayden at door, and backs away to foot of stairs. And still they come. Hayden enters, locks doors, puts key in his pocket, takes off gloves, rubs his hands and nose, trying to warm them, then comes down to fireplace and stands with his back to the fire. As he turns, he comes face to face with McGee, who has come to center. He goes to McGee slowly. I beg pardon, but who are you? McGee, center. I'm Mayor Cargan's butler. Mayor Cargan? Yes, he's here. Do you wish to see him? Hayden, importantly. Yes. Say to him that Mr. Hayden of the Root and Esquire and Suburban Road is calling. Oh, I see. Are you the president of that road, sir? Hayden, pompously. I most certainly am, sir. McGee looks at Hayden, then up at room right and laughs. Your wife's here. What? Yes, locked up in that room up there. McGee points up to room right on balcony. Hayden turns and looks up. As he turns, McGee fans him for a gun. Hayden turns to McGee quickly, sputtering. Pardon me, I just wanted to see if you had a gun on you. Just a minute, I'll tell the mayor the president has arrived. <laughs> Starts upstairs, laughing. Hayden, when McGee is on first landing. Are you a crazy man, sir? That's what the critics say, but I'm beginning to think they are all wrong. Sit down, Mr. Hayden. I'll tell the boys you're here. Unlocks door left and steps aside. The boys? Come on, boys, everything's all right. The president's here. As men come down, Hayden steps forward toward stairs. Watch your step, easy, that's it. One at a time, please. Lead on, boys, I'll walk a little behind. Cargan and Max come downstairs, followed by McGee, who covers them with gun. As men get to foot of stairs, Hayden backs away, thunderstruck. Max goes to table left, McGee goes over right. Cargan comes down to Hayden, center. Cargan, gruffly. Ah, uh, hello, Hayden. What is the meaning of this, Cargan? I don't know. Ask him. Nods towards McGee. Hayden, to Cargan. Who is he? I don't know, and I don't care a damn. I'm disgusted with the whole works. We're nil, that's all I know. Sits right of table left. Peters enters from door left. On seeing crowd of men, he starts to back out, but is stopped by McGee. No, you don't. Come back here. I'll keep my eye on you, too. You'd better sit down and join the boys, Hermie. Peters sits left of table. Hayden, up to McGee, who is right center. I'd very much like to know the reason for such strange actions, young man. Your wife will be down in a minute. She'll probably tell you all about it. Confound it, sir. My wife is home in bed. That's what you think. Laughs. <laughs> You're not the first fellow that's been fooled, you know. Hayden backs away from McGee. McGee throws keys to Peters. Here, Hermie. Take that key and open the first door to the left on the balcony, and tell Mrs. Hayden that her husband wants to see her downstairs right away. As Peters hesitates. Hurry along, that's a good ghost, go on. Peters, mad all through, does he is told, picking up the key from the floor and going upstairs. Better sit down, boys, and make yourselves comfortable. We're liable to have quite a wait. Max sits left of table. McGee goes upright. Well, I'll be running along. McGee stops Hayden as he starts for door. Better stay for a while, Mr. Hayden. I'd like to have your wife meet you. I don't think she's ever had the pleasure. Myra and Peters enter on balcony and start downstairs. Hayden, down to Cargan, right of table. What the devil sort of a man is this? Bland knocks on door. 
all jump and look up stage. Well, here's a novelty at last. A man without a key. It's bland. I have his key. I'll let him in. Starts for door. Don't bother. I have a dandy little key of my own. I'll let him in. Opens door, keeping all covered. Hayden goes over right. Bland enters as McGee unlocks door, the latter keeping him covered. Bland comes down right to Hayden. Men all sit as Bland enters. Bland to Hayden. What's the matter, governor? I don't know. Bland goes to McGee left center as he recognizes him. That's him, the man I told you about. He locked me in. Oh, hello, are you back again? I thought you jumped out of town. Bland, over to Cargan at table. McGee goes over right center. Did you get it all right? No, uh, he's got it. What? Rushes over to McGee. Give me that money. McGee covering Bland with gun. Say, I killed a man once for hollering at me. Bland backs away to left. Peters comes downstairs to left, above table, to Myra, as she advances slowly to center. Ah, uh, here we are. Mr. Hayden, although I think you are getting a shade the best of it, this young lady claims to be your wife. What? Over to Myra, center. You claim what? Go on, holler your head off, Grandpa. As she strolls languidly, over right, to fireplace. It's music to my ears to hear an old guy squawk. Sits in chair in front of fire. Hayden goes to Bland, left center. Bland waves Hayden away. Hayden goes upstage. Bland crosses to McGee, right center. What are you going to do with that money? McGee goes up around Bland and crosses right center, keeping all covered. I haven't got the money. All turn and look at him in amazement. It's on its way to Rooten. Miss Norton will see that it is placed in safe and proper hands directly she arrives at the office of the Rooten Daily Star. The Daily Star? Oh, we're gone. To McGee. Where did Mrs. Rose go? Out of your life forever, Cargan. She's got your number. Cargan lowers his head without speaking. Pause. Then McGee gets chair for Bland and places it right center. Sit down there. Bland pays no attention. Did you hear me? Sit. Bland sits slowly and sulkily. Sit down, Hermie. Come on, that's a nice ghost. Go on. Peters sits above table. McGee places chair for Hayden. Sit down, Hayden. I don't care to sit down, sir. Do as you're told. Sit down. Confound it, sir. Do you know that I am the president of the Roten Esquan Railway Company? I wouldn't care if you were president of the National League. Sit down. Hayden sits, indignant. McGee sits in chair, front of switchboard, facing all and covering them with gun. Now, we're all going to stay right here till that phone bell rings and I get word that Miss Norton is safe and sound in Rooten. That may mean three hours, or it may mean six hours, but we're all going to stay right here, together, no matter how long it takes. So get comfortable and sit as easy as you can. All move uneasily. Cargan to Max, after a pause. So you tried to cross me, eh? The chances are, I'll kill you for this. Bland, after a pause, looking at Hayden. I'm afraid I made a mistake in bringing you up here, Governor. Hayden, after a slight pause. You're always making mistakes, you damned blockheaded fool. Max, after a pause. I'm sorry I got you into this, Myra. No reply from her. Oh, Myra. I say, I'm sorry I got you into this. Myra turns and looks at Max. Oh, go to hell. Peters, after a slight pause. I hope to gosh you're all sent to prison for life. McGee, after a pause. This is going to be a nice pleasant little party. I can see that right now. After three counts, ring curtain. Slow curtain. 
End of Act One Act Two of Seven Keys to Ball Paint by George M. Cohen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. The curtain rises on the same situation. After curtain is up, there is silence for about six seconds. Then the clock is heard striking two. Hayden takes out his watch and looks at it. All squirm and look at each other impatiently. <sighs> two o'clock. We've been sitting here over twenty minutes already. Say, Hermie, you'd better put another log on the fire. Peters crosses to fire, puts a log on the fire, looks closely at Myra in front of the fireplace, then goes back to the former position and sits. I think someone ought to say something. Come on, let's start a conversation. Things are getting awfully dull. Hayden gets up after a short pause and goes towards McGee. This is all damned nonsense. I refuse to stay here another minute. McGee, coolly and without moving. Sit down, Hayden. I'm very sorry to inconvenience you in this way, but it's necessary that you should stay here and keep us company. So sit down before I shoot you down. That's a good little president. Hayden sits sulkily. That's it. Now let me see, what can we talk about to kill the monotony and keep things sort of lively? I have it. Let's all tell each other where we got our keys to Baldpate. All move uneasily. What do you think of the idea? No reply. No? Well, I'll start the ball rolling, then perhaps we'll all fess up. I brought a letter from the man who owns the inn to the caretaker, giving him instructions to turn the key over to me. That's how I got mine. Next. Pause. No one speaks. No? Big secrets, eh? Laughs. <laughs> By George, that's funny. Let's see, how many keys are there? I had the first, Bland the second, Miss Norton the third, our friend the ghost the fourth, this young lady had the fifth, and if I'm not mistaken, you had the sixth key, Mr. Cargan. Hayden doesn't count, he had Bland's key. Six keys to Baldpate so far. I wonder if there are any more. Peters, after a pause. There are seven keys to bowl, Pete. All turn and look at Peters in surprise. Seven? How do you know? The old man told me the day before he died. Mine's the original. All the others are imitations. All turn from him in disgust. Seven keys, eh? More company expected. More melodrama, I suppose. Where did you get your key, Bland? Bland and McGee together. None, None of your, your damn, damn business. business. McGee laughs. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. How about you, Mr. Cargan? Perhaps you'll be good enough to throw some light on the key subject. Where did you get yours? I wouldn't tell you if my life was at stake. Well, perhaps the young lady will be good enough to inform me where her key came from? All turn and look at Myra. Myra turns and faces men. I've no objections. Max, pleadingly. Myra, please. Myra, pointing to Max. He gave the key to me. All turn and look at Max. Cargan, to Max. Where did you get a key to Baldpate? I uh, can't tell you, Mr. Mayor. I've sworn never to tell. Cargan, to Myra. I suppose he also gave you the combination to the safe. He did. Max, pleadingly. Myra. Oh, shut up. You were never anything but a crybaby. You've got me into a pretty mess. Do you think I'm going to sit here like a fool and not pay you back when I've got the chance to do it? Gets up and faces men. They all stare at her. I'll tell you the whole scene. I was to come here and make off with the package, and Cargan was to follow and find it gone. We were to meet tomorrow and divide the money equally. Cargan turns on Max. You rat. 
Max turns from Cargan in a hangdog fashion. His excuse to Cargan for the disappearance of the money was going to be to accuse Bland of never having put it there. Points to Bland at mention of his name. What? Starts towards left. Sit down, Bland. Bland hesitates, then sits. Bland, turning to Hayden. Do you hear that, Governor? He was going to accuse me of stealing the money. Cargan to Max. You mark my words. I'm going to kill you for this. Bland to Cargan. Where did you get a key to Baldpate, Cargan? You told me you couldn't get in here unless I met you and unlocked the door. Cargan looks embarrassed but does not reply. I can explain that. All look toward her. He was to meet you here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Am I right? That's right. I made the appointment over the phone. Well, the plan was to steal in here in the dead of night and take the money. He fully intended to keep his appointment here tomorrow morning, however, and appeared just as much surprised as you would have been when you discovered the safe empty and the package gone. In other words, he was going to cross not only you, but Hayden and everyone else connected with the bribe. He tried to cross you. Points to Bland. And Lou Max tried to double-cross him. Points to Cargan. Laughs and sits. <laughs> if I hadn't been interrupted by our friend here, nods her head in McGee's direction, I'd have gotten the money and triple-crossed the whole outfit. What? Yes, that was my intention. Scruples are a joke when one is dealing with crooks. Cargan starts up. Who's a crook? Sit down, Cargan. Cargan, infuriated. Do you think I'll stand to be... McGee, sternly. Sit down, I tell you. I'm the schoolteacher here. Be a good little mare and sit down. Cargan sits. Myra, sneeringly, after a slight pause. Why, you're not even clever crooks. You trusted Max, and Max trusted me. <laughs> Laughs. <laughs> a fine chance either one of you had if I ever had gotten hold of that money. Hayden, too bland, after thinking a moment. Who is this woman? I don't know. Cargan turns to Hayden. Her name is Thornhill. Don't believe a word she says, Hayden. Her oath isn't worth a nickel. She's a professional blackmailer, pure and simple. Hayden, to Myra. Is this true? I never heard of a pure and simple blackmailer. Did you? Laughs. <laughs> so far as my word is concerned, I fancy it will carry as much weight as the word of a crooked politician or the word of his man Friday, whom he knows to be an ex-convict. Max starts up. What? Sit down, Maxie. It's just getting good. Max slinks into his chair. Hayden, too bland, who looks at him. Fine people you've introduced me to, you lunk-headed idiot. Well, what are you blaming me for? You wanted the deal put through, didn't you? After this, you can do your own crooked work. I'm not anxious to get mixed up in a thing of this kind. You've got a fine nerve to go after me. Hayden gets up. How dare you talk to your employer in such a manner? Oh, sit down. Hayden sits. What do you think I care for this job? I told you to stay out of the deal, that it was wrong. You know well enough that it's only cheating the city of Royton out of its rights. If this thing ever comes to light, we're all lucky if we don't spend five or six years in a stone yard. I tell you right now, if it comes to a showdown, I'm going to make a clean breast of the whole affair. I don't care who I send away, so long as I can save myself. You needn't think you can get me into a fix like this and have me keep my mouth shut. No, sir. I'm going to tell the truth, and I don't care a damn who suffers, as so long as I get away. Myra laughs. <laughs> One of our best little squealers. Bland. 
to Myra. Well, you squealed, didn't you? Sure, I'm with you, cutie. I'm going to scream my head off all over the place. All show alarm. Cargan to Max, after a pause. So, you tried to cross me, eh? Certainly I tried to cross you. Why shouldn't I? You're always crossing everybody, ain't ya? Rises. I've stood for your loud talk long enough, Cargan. I've been wanting to call you for the last two years. You're a great big bluff, that's all you are. And I'm gonna get even for that punch you took at me, do you hear? Now, you shoot any more of that killing stuff at me, I'll go after you like a wild bear. You're never gonna kill anybody. You haven't got the nerve. But I have. And the next bluff you make at me will be your last. Sits. It's your fault I'm mixed up in this affair. And the best thing you can do is to get me away clean, do you understand? Smashes table with fist. Pause. Then looks at Hayden. You didn't think you were going to get that franchise for 200000 did you, Hayden? Why, this man would have bled you for half a million before the bill went through, and then held you up for hush money besides. I know what I'm talking about. He was going to rob you, Hayden. And I dare him to call me a liar. All look at Cargan, who swallows the insult in fear of Max's attitude. Hayden, after a pause. Cargan. Is it true that you are going to rob me of this money? Cargan turns to Hayden after a slight pause. Well, if you want to know, yes, that's what I was going to do. Rob you. Just what you deserve. You were trying to rob the city, weren't you? You're just as much a thief as I am. If I'm a crook, it's your kind that has made me so. You and your rotten money... Tempting men to lie and steal. Settles back in his chair. Big corporations such as yours are the cause of corrupt politics in this country, and you're just the kind of a sneak that helps build prisons that are filled with the poor devils that do your dirty work. You're worse than a crook. You're a maker of crooks. Turns to Hayden, leans forward and points at him. But I promise you, Hayden, that if I go up for this... You'll go up with me. It's your fault that I entered into this thing, and by gad, I'll get even if I have to lie over a Bible and swear your life away. Turns, facing audience. Rob you. Ha! Ah, you've got a hell of a gall to yell about being robbed, you have. Peters, after slight pause. I hope the prison catches fire and you're all burned to a crisp. McGee laughs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my suggestion was to start a conversation, not a rough house. Hayden, after a slight pause. This woman who took the money. Who is she? A newspaper reporter. On the Daily Star. The sheet that has fought me ever since I've been in office. They've got me this time, sure. Max, after a pause, looking nervously at McGee. How much longer are you going to keep us here? That's for the telephone to say. I'll release you as soon as I'm sure Miss Norton is safe and sound in Rootin. All turn toward McGee, surprised. Then you're not gonna turn us over to the police? Certainly not. Why should I? Movement of relief from all. Peters gets up. Because there are a lot of crooks. All turn towards Peters. Oh, how I'd love to be on the jury. Sit down, Hermie. I need a little target practice, and remember, there's no law against killing ghosts. Peters sits. There's no train to route until five o'clock. That means we must stay here till six, eh? I'm afraid so, unless they make it by automobile from Ascalon. It means several hours at the best, so you might as well be patient. You've got a long wait. All move uneasily. Myra, cuddling up in her chair. Me for my beauty sleep. Good night. Short pause, then phone rings. All start and stare at it. McGee gets up and stops buzzer. She couldn't have made it as quick as that. It's over an hour by automobile. McGee keeps them all covered with gun. Answer that phone, please, Miss Thornhill. Myra gets up and goes to phone. 
McGee backs upstage. I'm going to keep looking straight ahead of me tonight. Hurry, please, give me the message as you get it. I'll tell you what to say if it requires an answer. Myra at phone in a bored tone. Hello? Yes, bald paid in. Yes, I know who you mean. Just a moment. To McGee. Someone wants to talk to you. Get the name. In phone. Hello, who is this, please? Oh, yes. Very well, I'll tell him. Turns to McGee. Miss Norton. Say that it is impossible for me to turn my back long enough to come to the phone, and that you will take the message and repeat it to me as you get it. Myra, in phone. McGee backs up right center. It is impossible for him to turn his back long enough to come to the phone. You are to give me the message, and I am to repeat it to him as I get it. You are talking from the commercial house in a skewan. You missed the package of money five minutes ago. All turn. You either dropped it in the inn before you left, or else lost it while hurrying down the mountain. Search the inn thoroughly. Pause while all look around the room. Ask him whether or not you should notify the police. All show fear. You're nearly crazy and don't know which way to turn. Just a moment. Turns and looks at McGee. Well, what shall I say? McGee looks around at all, then answers after a pause. Say to hold the wire. Myra, in phone. Hold the wire, please. Gets up and goes towards chair right. The money lost. Thank God. <laughs> there goes their evidence. Who ever heard of losing two hundred thousand dollars? Can't be done outside of Wall Street. Surest thing you know, she's old mad. McGee smiles. You're a quick thinker, Miss Thornhill. Myra turns to McGee. What do you mean? That I don't believe you got that message at all. Myra shrugs her shoulders indifferently. Very well. She's on the wire. See for yourself. Sits in chair in front of fire. Come here, Hermie. My name's not Henry. My name's Peters. Well, whatever it is, come here. Peters goes up to McGee, upright. I know you don't like anybody in this room any better than I do, so I'm going to take a chance on you. Take this gun and guard that door until I get this message, and you kill the first man or woman that makes a move. Do you understand? Peters, vindictively. I'd like to kill them all. Don't shoot unless you have to. He hands Peters the gun and goes to the phone. Hello? Damn you, Cargan. I've got you at last. Peters goes towards Cargan and is grabbed by Hayden. Myra screams and jumps up. Bland springs on McGee and struggles with him. Max rushes over to Wright, and the two overpower McGee at phone. When Hayden grabs Peters, Cargan rushes over and struggles with Peters, wrestling the gum from him. Max to McGee. Take it easy, young fella. You haven't got a chance. We got him. Cargan. After wrenching gun from Peters, he hits him a blow, knocking him down. Oh, what do you think of that? Bland and Max are right, each holding McGee by the arms. Peters is on the floor, center. Cargan standing over him with gun. Hayden is left, looking on. Cargan to Peters. So you wanted to take a shot at me, eh? Kicks Peters. Get up. Peters gets up in fear. Cargan backs upstage slightly. Put them both up in the room where he puts us. And lock the door. I can make a getaway from the window, Cargan. I did it myself. Ah, <laughs> there's no window in that room. It's a linen closet. Put them up there. He backs up stage, gun in hand. Peters starts upstairs. McGee to Cargan, as he comes to center on way to stairs. What's the idea, Cargan? Cargan, backing up center and pointing gun. Go on. I'm the schoolteacher now. Do as you're told. Hayden goes to extreme left as Peters and McGee go upstairs, followed by Max. 
Land goes right. Below phone. Cargan speaks next lines to Myra, with his back to her. Get on that phone, Miss Thornhill, and tell that woman not to notify the police. Say that she is to return here at once, and see what she says. Myra goes to phone. McGee and Max are now on landing. Peters is standing at door of room left on balcony. Myra in phone. Hello? Yes. Why, the message is that you are not to notify the police of the loss. Say nothing to anyone, but return here at once. That is the message. Yes, goodbye. Hangs up, receiver. Cargan to Myra, watching McGee. All right. Myra, rising from switchboard. As quick as she can get here, she says. Goes down right to chair. McGee stops on landing as soon as he hears phone conversation. What are you going to do, Cargan? Never mind. I'm running things now. Get in here. Peters exits room left on balcony. You harm that girl and I'll get you if it's the last act of my life. I've read that kind of talk in books. I write books of that kind, but I'm talking real talk now. Max, to McGee. Go on, get in there. McGee goes upstairs and exits into room left. Max locks door and comes to foot of stairs. Bland has gone left. Cargan puts gun in his pocket and comes down center. Hayden, over to Cargan at center. Now what's the move, Cargan? We're going to get that money if she's got it on her. You don't think she's fool enough to bring it back with her if she's trying to get away with it, do you? What are you going to do with it if you find it on her, Cargan? Keep it, of course. It's my money. Our agreement holds good. You people will get the franchise, don't worry. Why, you've just openly declared that you were going to rob me of the money. Oh, because I was mad clean through. Wasn't I being accused right and left? I didn't mean a word I said, Hayden. I don't even know what I said. Pats Hayden ingratiatingly on the shoulders, then goes up center, looking at room left. Hayden goes to Bland, who is below table left. What do you think, Bland? Cargan and Max come down stage to center. Don't ask me. You bawled me out once tonight. That's enough. I haven't forgotten what you said to me, Mr. Max. I don't want you to forget it. I want you to remember it all your life. As Cargan reaches for gun. I wouldn't care if you had six guns on you. Cut out that wild talk. I ain't gonna listen to it anymore. Why, you're nothing but a cheap coward, Cargan. Cargan looks at Max a moment, then turns upstage, cowed. Max crosses to Myra, right. So you tried to double-cross me, eh? Myra turns and faces Max. Why, certainly. Who are you? Why, damn you, I... Raises his hand to strike Myra, who shrinks away, bland, crossing quickly to center. Here, wait a minute, Max. Nothing like that while I'm around. Max turns to bland. Maybe you want some of it. Why, I... Raises his hand to strike bland. Bland grabs Max's arm and throws it back. Now behave yourself. The same speech you just made to Cargan goes for me. I want you to cut out this wild talk. I'm not going to listen to any more of it. I'll put you on your back if you make another bluff at me. Hayden goes to Max and Bland, center. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Max and Bland look each other in the eye for a moment. Then Max goes upright, near safe. Bland turns to Hayden after Max has gone upright. You keep out of this, Hayden. You'll get all you're looking for, if you don't. Raises his hand to Hayden as if to strike. Put it down. Put it down, do you hear me? What do you mean by raising your hand to me? Why, damn me, for two pins I'd take and wipe up the floor with you. I can whip a whole army of cowards like you. Now get away from me. Get away from me before I knock you down. Bland, surprised at Hayden's attitude, goes up to center door 
after staring at Hayden a moment. Hayden goes to Myra, right. Max goes to safe and begins working combination. Now, madam, what do you mean by claiming to be my wife? I demand an explanation. Myra turns quickly and angrily on Hayden. Now let me tell you something, old man. You can scare these three little boys, but I don't want you to annoy me, because I've got a nasty temper. So go on, get away, before I lose it. Hayden stares at Myra, dumbfounded, then goes quickly to left. Myra seats herself in chair after Hayden turns from her. Max, by this time, has worked the combination of the safe, and at this point the door flies open. He grabs a gun from the safe and slams door shut. Cargan, who has been standing at foot of stairs, looking up at room left, turns quickly as he hears the door slam and crosses quickly to right center, catching Max at safe door. Bland crosses Cargan to left center. Cargan, pulling gun. Get away from that safe. What are you doing there? Max flashes revolver. Myra rises and stands left of chair below it. Ah, you needn't be afraid. I ain't gonna do anything. Only I... Max has come in front of desk while speaking above lines and now takes deliberate aim at Myra and shoots. She screams and drops into chair. Bland runs to Myra. God! Cargan crosses to left of Max. What's the matter, Max? Have you gone crazy? Puts gun in his pocket. Hayden over to right of Max, looking towards Myra. Now we are in for it. Is she hurt? Max, down left of Hayden. I couldn't help it. It was an accident. I didn't mean it, I tell you. McGee raps on door upstairs. All look up. McGee from upstairs. What's wrong down there? Raps again. What's happened? All stand rigid, staring. Bland, in a low voice. Pull out the lights. Cargan tiptoes upstage and turns out bracket lights leaving only the reflection of burning logs on Myra's face, then tiptoes back to center. Anything serious, Bland? You're a damn good shot, Max. You got her all right. Is feeling Myra's pulse. Don't say that. Backs away to left center. It can't be possible. It's all over. She's gone. Drops her hand, then turns her chair round to right. Max, right center, wild-eyed. But I didn't mean it, I tell you. It was an accident. You lie. I saw you take aim. So did I. Max, pleadingly. Oh, no, don't say that. It isn't so. Before heaven, I swear it was an accident. McGee pounds on door, upstairs. Hayden, Cargan, and Bland. To Max, Hayden is left of Max. Shh! All look up in direction of door. McGee from room right. Tell me what the matter is down there. Cargan goes to foot of stairs and calls up. Everything's all right. Nothing wrong. I know better. Open this door. Pounds on door. Give me a hand, Cargan, and we'll get her out of here. Max and Hayden go up center. Cargan over to Bland. Where do you mean? Bland, pointing to room right on balcony. Up in that room. Come on, hurry up. Cargan assists Bland in lifting Myra to the ladder's shoulders. Bland starts for the stairs, carrying Myra. Cargan following with her wraps, etc. Max, right center, as Bland passes with Myra. I didn't mean it, I tell you. I'm innocent. Why, I wouldn't arm a fly. Hayden goes right center to Max and silences him roughly. Keep quiet, you damn fool. Do you want the world to hear you? McGee resumes pounding on the door. Just as Bland and Cargan get to the first landing, McGee kicks the door open from the inside, and in the breakaway the lock falls to the floor. McGee enters on the balcony as the door flies open, Peters following him out. McGee comes to the first landing and follows Bland and Cargan up the opposite stairs a few steps. Peters remains outside door right. 
Bland and Cargan stop only a second on the first landing, and then continue on up the stairs during the following lines. What's happened? Uh, she's fainted, that's all. Where are you taking her? You'll keep out of this young fellow if you know what's good for you. Bland and Cargan exit into room right, Cargan closing the door. McGee has followed them on balcony, watches them exit with Myra, then rushes downstairs to Hayden Center. Who fired that pistol shot? Max, right, blurts out. It was an accident. Hayden, quickly, to Max, right, center. Shut up. See here, Hayden, if there's anything wrong here, you can't afford to mix up in it. You're too big a man. Max, hysterically. I, I didn't mean to kill her. I I'm not responsible. It was an accident. McGee, right, center. Oh, we have a murder case on our hands. Is that the idea? Hayden, right of McGee. I don't know. But whatever it is, we're all in this thing together. We must frame a story and stick to it, do you understand? No, I don't understand. We must claim suicide. Max, going towards center, Hayden goes up center. That's it. She killed herself. I was an eyewitness. She killed herself. Do you think I'd enter into such a dastardly scheme? Bland and Cargan enter and stand on balcony center listening. No, if it's murder, there's the murderer. Points to Max, crosses to him right, then back to left center. Self-confessed. But you're all as guilty as this man, every one of you. It's the outcome and result of rotten politics and greed. I'll swear to every word that's been uttered here tonight. I've had my ear against the crack of that door for the last five minutes. I overheard every word that passed between you. I'll tell the story straight from the shoulder. You can't crawl out of it, gentlemen, with your suicide alibi. It's murder in the first degree, and I'm going to help make you pay the penalty. Hayden and Max stand staring at him. Hayden goes upright, near desk. Cargan and Bland, after a bit of pantomime, come downstairs. Cargan goes to the left of McGee and Bland to right of him. Max is right. Cargan, after a pause, left of McGee. I'm afraid you're in the wrong here, young fellow. Peters sneaks across the balcony to right of it and stands listening to next few speeches, hidden behind post right. I'm sorry for you. From the bottom of my heart, I pity you. Take stage a little left. McGee does not reply, simply looks at Cargan, then at Bland. Bland, after a pause. She's dead. You killed her all right. McGee looks Bland in the eye, then at Cargan. The latter turns upstage after a pause, then crosses down to back of chair left. McGee crosses to Hayden, who comes down center. Hayden comes down center to right of McGee. Better plead insanity, old man. It's the only chance you've got. McGee stares at Hayden, then crosses over to Wright, and looks Max straight in the eye. Max stares back at him. Max, after a pause. Bad business is carrying guns. Who was the woman? Your wife? Peters exits into the room on balcony right, closing door. Bland is left center. McGee turns, sees the three staring at him, smiles, and comes center. No, no, gentlemen, you can't get away with it. It's good melodrama, but it's old stuff. I know every trick of the trade. I've written it by the yard. You can't intimidate me. I won't be third degreed. You work very well together, but it's rough work, and it isn't going to get you anything. Besides, you forget I have a witness in Peters, the hermit. All turn and look up at the room left. Cargan. Front of table left. Looks up at room, then says to Bland, Get him. Bring him down. Goes to foot of stairs as Bland goes upstairs. Bland runs up and looks into room left, then comes out on balcony. He's gone. Hayden looks at Max, then back to Bland. Gone? Where? Bland comes quickly down the stairs. He probably found a way. 
He knows the place better than we do. Goes right of McGee. Cargan comes down to McGee, right center. I saw you when you fired. You shot to kill. Bland, right of McGee. I tried to knock the gun from your end, but I was too late. Goes upstage. Hayden, right of Bland. I didn't witness the shooting myself, but I turned just in time to grab you before you got away. Max, right. But you shouldn't have choked her. That was the brutal part of it. McGee starts for Max, who backs away to the fireplace, frightened. Why, you dog, I... Chief Kennedy appears outside door and pounds on it three times. All on stage stop abruptly and look toward door, holding the picture for a repeat of the pounding. Cargan, loudly. Who's there? Kennedy yells through door from outside. Open this door in the name of the law. Warn lights. The police. Hayden, quickly to Max. Keep quiet. Gets behind desk. Bland to Cargan. You'd better let him in, Cargan. McGee starts for door. I'll unlock the door. No, you don't. I'll attend to it. Crosses McGee, goes up to door, and unlocks it. Kennedy steps in, watching Cargan as the latter locks the door. As Cargan is about to put key in his pocket, Kennedy speaks. Bland has gone left, above table, when Cargan goes up to door. Kennedy, up left center, just inside door. Here, wait a minute. I'll take that key. I'll take that gun I saw you stick in your pocket, too. Bland takes a couple of steps towards Kennedy, up left. What authority of you? Kennedy comes down left center to Bland. Close your trap. I'm Chief Kennedy of the Ascawan Falls Police Headquarters. That's my authority. Cargan, down to Kennedy, pointing to Bland. It's all right, Chief. He's all right. Where's the light switch? Up there to your left. Kennedy goes up left of door and turns on lights, then comes downstage left of Cargan, recognizing him. Hello, Mr. Mayor. What are you doing here? I can explain all that. McGee, pointing to Max. That man has a gun on him also. Hayden moves over towards left, slowly. Kennedy goes over right center and looks McGee over carefully. Who are you? Cargan crosses to left center. I'll tell you who I am at the proper time and place. You'd better get on your job quick here, Chief. There's something doing. Two of these men are carrying weapons, and two of them also have keys to that door. I'm telling you this to prevent a getaway. What are you trying to do? Run the police department? This is an important case, Chief. Thousands of dollars are involved and a crime committed besides. I advise placing every man in this room under arrest immediately. Kennedy to Cargan. What's this all about, Mr. Mayor? All appear anxious. He's for flushing, Chief. He's stalling for a chance to break away. Eh, don't be afraid. I've got men outside. Nobody will get away. Crosses McGee to Max, right center, and looks at him closely. Lou Max, eh? Quite a crowd of celebrities. To Max. You got a gun? Max hands him his gun. What are you toting this for? No reply from Max. Chief turns and fans McGee. He's clean. Turns McGee upstage and crosses to Cargan. I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Mayor, but I'll have to relieve you of that hardware. Cargan hands Chief his gun. And the key, too, please. Cargan hands Chief his key. I've come here to investigate, and I've got to do my duty. Crosses Cargan over to Bland, left center. Bland, holding up his hands as Chief approaches him. There's nothing on me. Kennedy, fans Bland. Who's got the other key? He said there were two. Bland, points to Hayden. This gentleman. Kennedy, goes to Hayden, left, who hands the Chief his key. Hello, Mr. Hayden. Huh. This is a real highbrow affair, isn't it? Well... Smiles, goes up center of right of Cargan, and looks them all over. Come on, somebody open up. What's the big gathering all about? Max, pointing to McGee. He's got a key. Make him give it up. Kennedy, to McGee. Come on. McGee hands Chief his key. 
You got anything more to say? I prefer to tell my story in the presence of witnesses. I insist upon the immediate arrest of everyone here, myself included. Don't mind him, Chief. He's a madman. Well... Somebody telephoned police headquarters from here about two hours ago, and when we got on the wire, Central said they'd hung up. We got a new connection and asked if they'd called, and some woman said, no, it was a mistake. We got to thinking it over at headquarters, and it didn't listen good. So we looked it up and found out that the call had been put in from Baldpate Inn. So I made up my mind to come here and investigate. Now... When I started up the mountain ten minutes ago, the lights were on full blast. And all of a sudden, they went out. And there was a pistol shot, too. Every one of my men heard the report, and we all agree it came from this direction. Now what's it all about? Twas I who called up police headquarters. All look at McGee. You. Sergeant said it was a woman's voice on the wire. That was the second time when you called up, but I tried to get you first. What for? I don't intend to tell my story until I'm under oath. I want every word I say to go on the court records. I charge these men with conspiracy and murder. What is this, Cargan? The poor devil's gone mad, I guess. He shot and killed a woman a few minutes ago, and he's accused every man here of the crime. Murder, eh? Yes. Cold-blooded murder. Kennedy, to McGee. Who was the woman you shot? Don't let these men get away with this, Chief. I can prove my innocence. Pointing to Max. There's the real murderer. These men know it as well as I do. They're accusing me in an attempt to save their own necks. They're afraid to tell the truth because this man is a squealer, and they know that a confession from him of a scheme to steal the right of way for a streetcar franchise in Rutan will send them all to the state penitentiary. I can prove why I'm here tonight. Ask these men for their reason for being here, and let's hear what they have to say. Kennedy looks from one to the other without speaking. He's been raving like that for the last ten minutes, Chief. Kennedy to McGee. What is your reason for being here? I came here to write a book. Kennedy to Cargan. You're right. He's a lunatic, sure. To Cargan. Who was the woman that telephoned to headquarters? Miss Norton of the Rootin' Star. The Rootin' Star, eh? To Cargan. Is she the woman that was killed? No. Her name is Thornhill. Where is she? In one of the rooms upstairs. Was there anybody else here besides you people? Yes. Peters, the hermit. Another crazy man, eh? But he's disappeared. Well, he won't go far. Goes upstage and looks out of the door. I've got the house surrounded. Coming downstage. I'll look the ground over before I send for the coroner. He won't be here till seven or eight o'clock. You people will have to stay here till he comes. Cargan, Land, and Hayden sit near table left. Max sits right. What room is she in? Looking up at balcony. I'll show you, Chief. Starts towards stairs, leading the way, followed by the Chief, Hayden, Bland, and Max in order named. All look back at McGee as they go upstairs. Kennedy to McGee when he gets on balcony. Take my tip. Don't try to get away, young fella. One of those cops outside will blow your head off if you do. McGee goes left near foot of stairs as men go up. You needn't be afraid. I'm going to stay right here, and I'm going to make sure these other men do until we're all taken into custody. It's a sad case, Chief. We're used to that. They generally go out of their minds after they shoot. Where is she? Cargan goes to door of room right. In here, Chief. Chief exits into the room, followed by Hayden, Bland, Max, and Cargan, the latter closing the door. During the last few speeches, Peters has been peering through glass in dining room door left. He now enters and goes quickly to McGee, centered. I carry the body from that room through the secret passage to the cellar. McGee, amazed. What? I heard them accuse you of the crime. Backs towards door left, slowly. They'll never find the secret passage, ha? Huh? Laughs. And they'll never find the body, ha, ha, ha. Laughs viciously. What did you do that for, you damn fool? Door opens on balcony right. Hist! He points up at door right on balcony. McGee looks up. Peters exits hurriedly through door left. 
Cargan enters, wild-eyed, from room, runs downstairs, and comes to left center. Max follows him down and goes to right. Hayden follows Max and comes down to left center. Bland follows Hayden and comes to right. All men show extreme fear. McGee, standing center, watches them. Kennedy comes out on balcony, looks at people downstairs, then back at room for a moment, then out again at Q. Hayden, to Cargan, who is front of table left. What do you make of this, Cargan? The damn place is uh, haunted. She must have escaped by the window. How could a dead woman jump from the window? Besides, the windows are closed. They all stand staring up at balcony. Kennedy appears from room right and closes door. Kennedy comes to center of balcony and stands looking down at men. Say, what are you fellas trying to do? String me? Starts downstairs. You know, I was born and brought up in New York City, even if I do live in Ascawan Falls. Comes down to center and looks them all over. I can't understand it at all. She was in that room ten minutes ago, Chief. I'll take a solemn oath on that. My God, I'm going insane. Grabs chair to steady himself. Say, what the devil is this all about? Looks from one to the other. If you people think you can make a joke out of me, you're mistaken. I won't stand for it. Now come on, what's the answer? It's no joke, Chief. There has been a murder committed here. Then where's the victim? In the cellar. What? what? In the cellar? If I'm not mistaken, that's where she was taken after the murder. You lie. You know she was taken to that room. Points to room right on the balcony. You saw his carrier there. Of course he did. Kennedy to McGee. What are you trying to do, trap me in the cellar? I tell you, Chief, you'll find the victim in the cellar. Then you can judge for yourself if I'm as crazy as these men claim me to be, or whether they've suddenly gone mad themselves. Kennedy blows his whistle. Now I'll get to the bottom of this thing pretty quick. Rushes up to the door, unlocks and opens it. Two cops enter, come to left of stage, up center, and await orders. Kennedy locks doors and goes to cops. Search the cellar of this place and report to me here what you find, every nook and corner. And don't leave a thing unturned, understand? Cops salute. Mary appears outside door. Hurry up, then. Cops exit through door left. Kennedy comes down center. If this thing is a practical joke, you'll all land in jail for it. I'm not going to be made the laughing stock of Ascawan Falls, I'll tell you that right now. Mary, who has been peering through door, opens it during this speech and enters. Kennedy turns as door opens and goes upstage. Hello, who's this? McGee goes left as Mary enters. Miss Norton. Mary locks door and starts down left center. Kennedy to Mary. I'll take that key, please. Mary hands Chief the key and goes to McGee, left center. Why are the police here? Kennedy goes down right center to Bland. McGee, reassuring Mary. It's all right. Kennedy to Bland. Who is this woman? She claims to be a newspaper reporter. She's a thief. She stole a package of money. Whose money? My money. Cargan, left in front of table. No, my money. It's bribe money, Chief. Where is the money? Mary turns and faces Chief. The money's been lost. What? what? Say, what the hell are you people trying to do to me, anyway? McGee to Mary. Where did you lose it? Mary to McGee. Kennedy goes over, listening. I don't know. Somewhere between here and Askewan. I searched every inch of the way from the bottom of the mountain to the top. It's gone, I'm afraid. Where is Mrs. Rhodes? She became too hysterical to return. I left her at the commercial house in Askewan. How much money was it? Two hundred thousand dollars. Kennedy looks from one to the other. Come on! Cut out the kid and stuff. How much was it? Hayden, left, near table. That's the exact amount the package contained, Chief. Two hundred thousand dollars. Kennedy to Mary. Where'd you get this money? I gave it to her. Where did you get it? From Mayor Cargan. Where did you get the money, Cargan? No reply from Cargan. McGee 
after a pause. He took the money from that safe. Kennedy goes upstage a couple of steps, looks at safe, comes back to center. How did you open the safe, Cargan? I didn't open the safe. Who did? Peters, the hermit. Who put the money in the safe? Bland. Points at Bland. That man to your right. Kennedy, over to Bland, right center. Where'd you get the money to put in the safe? From Mr. Hayden. Kennedy, looks at Hayden, left. Is this true, Mr. Hayden? I refuse to answer for fear of incriminating myself. Kennedy, over to Max, right. What do you know about this, Max? Don't ask me, I don't know. My brain's on fire, I'm going mad. Tugs at his collar, breathing hard. Kennedy comes to center and looks them all over. Huh! Hayden gave the money to Bland. Bland put the money in the safe. Peters opened the safe. Cargan took the money from Peters. This fellow took the money from Cargan and gave it to the newspaper reporter. She loses the money in the mountains. Then somebody killed a woman, and the corpse got up and walked away. And you expect me to believe this bunk, do ya? Mary to McGee. What does he mean by saying that somebody killed a woman? Don't worry. It's all right. Mary and McGee go up left near foot of stairs. Cop, off stage. Come on, come on. Go on, get in there. He opens door left and throws Peters to center of stage. The other cop follows them on. That's all we could find in the cellar, Chief. No dead bodies or packages of money? Nothing else, Chief. Goes up left near door. Kennedy looks at Peters and laughs. Oh, it's you, is it, Peters? So that's where you hide, eh? In the cellar of Baldpate? Well, you'll have a nice room in the county jail tomorrow. Damn the police. I hate them. Kennedy throws Peters to right. Go on, get over there. Two cops as he goes up to the door. Guard the outside. As he goes up to the door, Mary and McGee come down to left center. Chief unlocks door to cops. And question anybody who passes up or down the mountain. Opens door. Cops exit. Chief locks door and comes down stage to Mary. You'll uh, have to step upstairs, miss. I've got a lot to say to these men here, and I'm not particular about my language when I'm on a case. So come on, step upstairs. Hayden, extreme left near table. I don't believe this girl lost the money, Chief. Well, I'll get the matron of the jail here and have her searched. If she's got anything on her, we'll get it. Mary starts for stairs, Chief following her up. Go in one of those rooms till I call you. Mary is now on balcony center. Chief comes downstage to center. Who is this woman the girl says she left at the commercial house? Mrs. Rhodes. She's all right. Bland goes slightly towards Cargan. How do we know? Maybe they're working together. That's enough, Bland. Kennedy, as he goes towards phone, all back up and watch him. I'll call up the commercial house and see if she's there. In phone. Hello? Get me 35 Central, quick. Mary exits into room right on balcony. Ring me when you get it. Hangs up receiver and comes down to center. What's her name again? Mrs. Rhodes. Mary screams off stage and rushes from room to balcony. <coughs> What's the matter? Mary, screaming. She's dead! Someone's killed her! Who? Mary, hysterically. That woman there in the room! This is terrible! Kennedy looks at McGee. McGee looks at Cargan. All stand rigid, staring at each other for a moment. Then Kennedy, Cargan, Bland, Hayden, and Max rush upstairs on balcony and cross to room right. As they pass in front of Mary, she backs up against windows and stands with arms outstretched against them. Peters is standing right, laughing. McGee goes over right to Peters quickly. What did you do? Bring her back to that room? Isn't that what you wanted me to do? No, you blithering idiot. Turns and takes Mary in his arms as she runs to him. Tell me who did this. How did it happen? It's all right. Take it easy. Max, Bland, Cargan, and Hayden enter from room right in this rotation all wild-eyed. They line up on balcony and keep their eyes glued to the door of the room. Kennedy enters on balcony, 
also keeping his eyes fixed on the room. He looks at the men on balcony, and then down at McGee and Mary, who stare up at him, then at Peters, who is over right. Say, what are you people trying to do to me? Two men on balcony, who are still staring at door. Go on, get downstairs where you belong. Four men come downstairs and go to former position. Telephone rings. Kennedy runs downstairs. Don't touch that phone. I'll answer it. Looks from one to the other suspiciously. Is this dump haunted or is the joke on me? No one replies. The phone still rings. I'll soon find out. Goes to phone. All back up and watch him. Hello? Yes, I called you. Say, listen, Charlie, this is Chief Kennedy talking. Is there a woman there by the name of Rhodes? She was... She did, eh? How long ago? I see. What's that? She asked you to mind a package for you till she got back. All look at each other, startled. Where have you got it? In the safe? Say, listen, Charlie. Call headquarters right away and get a man over there. Give him that package and tell him to bring it up to Bald Paid Inn as quick as he can, understand? Never mind, you do as I tell you. And listen, tell them to guard the garage or the depot and put all strangers under arrest, men and women. I know what I'm doing, Charlie. You take orders from me. And listen, get the coroner on the phone and tell him to get up here to Bald Paid Inn in a rush. This is a case for him. Don't lose any time now. Keep your mouth shut and get busy. Hangs up receiver and comes to center. All come forward. She left the hotel a quarter of an hour ago. She put the package in the hotel safe before she went. He looks them all over. They stand staring at each other. Huh. Somebody kills a woman, the victim disappears, and then comes back. That's pretty good stuff. McGee, aside to Mary, writes center. How do you account for this? Mary, aside to McGee. She must have stolen the money from me as we were running down the mountain. Whistle is heard outside door. All turn and look toward door. They got somebody. Rushes up to door and unlocks it. Cop enters. Chief locks door. What is it? A woman. Shoot her in. Unlocks door, opens it and closes it as cop exits. Here comes the bite, I guess, that tried to fly away with the coin. Opens the door as Mrs. Rhodes appears. She enters and watches Kennedy as he locks door. Mrs. Rhodes turns, takes in situation, then to Chief. What is the meaning of this? Kennedy, up near door. That's what I'm trying to find out. Mrs. Rhodes goes to Mary, right center. Is there any trace of the money? Mary turns from her without replying. Mrs. Rhodes then turns and looks at men, who all give her a contemptuous look. Kennedy comes down stage center, standing back of her. Hayden crosses to left center between Cargan and Kennedy. Are you going to have these women searched, Chief? Kennedy, down left of Mrs. Rhodes. Maybe it won't be necessary. Looks intently at Mrs. Rhodes over her left shoulder. We'll wait until we see what's in the package she left at the commercial house. Mrs. Rhodes starts, regains her composure, then seeing all watching her, she turns and makes a dash for the door. Chief speaks as he follows her up. Hayden crosses back to left. No, you don't. Nobody leaves here until this whole thing has been cleared up and I find out who killed that woman. Mrs. Rhodes turns startled. <gasps> killed a woman? Over to Cargan. What does he mean? Cargan turns from her without speaking. She goes to Mary. Mary to Mrs. Rhodes. You stole the money from me, didn't you? Mrs. Rhodes goes to Cargan without replying to Mary. Cargan looks Mrs. Rhodes straight in the eye. I'll never trust another woman as long as I live. Peters, right. They're no good. They never were. Kennedy, to Peters. Shut up! Comes to Mrs. Rhodes at center. Well, what have you got to say, Mrs.? Mrs. Rhodes, after a pause. Yes, but I did steal the money. Mary looks at McGee. Others look at Mrs. Rhodes. Mrs. Rhodes, 
over to Cargan, left. But I did it for you, Jim Cargan. I knew that if the story was ever made public, you would be a ruined man. I knew the package of money was the evidence that would convict you. I intended to return it to Mr. Hayden and try to kill off the bribe and save you from disgrace. I did all this because I thought you cared. And what is my reward? You stand there ready to turn against me, to condemn me. Very well, now I'll turn. Turns to Kennedy. Officer, these men have bargained to cheat the city of Rutan. I demand their arrest on the charge of conspiracy. It's a lie. It's the truth, Chief. The absolute truth. This young lady and I will testify against these men and prove them guilty of conspiracy and murder. Murder? What have you got to say to this, Mr. Cargan? Nothing at all. I'm through. Sits at table left. Bland goes upstage, then crosses to above table left. So am I. I can't stand this any longer. I'm going mad. Goes to Chief. Peters takes chair. Max vacates. During following speech, McGee takes Mary upright. I want you to know the real truth. "'Twas I who killed that woman upstairs. I shot her down like a dog. I know that I haven't got a chance, but I don't want to be sent to the chair. I'll confess. I'll tell the truth. I'll turn state's evidence. Anything. But for God's sakes, don't let them kill me. Kneels at Kennedy's feet. Kennedy to Max. Get up. Max rises. Chief takes handcuffs from his pocket. Come on, you'll have to wear these, young fellow. Puts handcuffs on Max. Mrs. Rhodes goes to foot of stairs. Bland, throwing up hands. Here we go. Hayden, to Cargan. What are we going to do, Cargan? No less than ten years, I'm afraid. Kennedy, to Max. Go on, get over there. Pushes Max over right, then goes upstage right and down in circle. Max takes Peter's chair. Mrs. Rhodes. Goes to Mary, right center. Can you ever forgive me? Mary, giving Mrs. Rhodes her hand. I didn't understand. I do now. Both go to foot of stairs, crossing in front of Chief. Kennedy, down to McGee, right center. And you came here to write a book, eh? That was the original idea. You know, I don't know yet whether you people are kidding me or not. All turn toward door as police whistle is heard. They've got somebody. Rushes up to door and unlocks it. Cop enters. He closes door. Well, what now? Cop. Hands package to chief. A package brought to you by the police messenger. He says it's from the commercial house. All start. Tell the messenger to hurry back and tell the coroner to hurry up. Opens door. Cop exits. Chief locks door and comes downstage a bit. A sickly smile on his face. Say, before I open this thing, I want to tell you something. If this turns out to be a bunch of cigar coupons, I'm going to smash somebody, sure. I won't stand to be strung, even if I am a small-town cop. Opens package and sees bills. Great Scott, it's the real thing. How much did you say was here? Two hundred thousand dollars. Hayden goes to Kennedy Center. I'll take that money, please. It belongs to me. Cargan goes to Kennedy, center. No, it doesn't. It belongs to me. You hold that money, Chief. It's the only real evidence of bribery we've got. Go away! Hayden goes upstage. Cargan goes right of chair at table. McGee goes center. You needn't tell me what to do. I know my business. Hayden crosses to left of table. Kennedy puts money in his pocket and goes to phone. As he does so, all on stage, back up and watch him. In phone. Hello? Get me 13 Central. Wait. Hello? Is that you, Jane? This is the chief. I want to talk to my wife. Wait. Hello? Hello, Betty? Listen, Betty, get this clear. Get some things together and get the children ready and take that five o'clock train to New York. Never mind. Now listen. When you get there, look up the railroads 
Get on the first and quickest train that goes to Montreal. Montreal. I'll be there waiting for you Thursday morning. Don't ask a lot of questions. Do as I tell you. What are we going to do there? We're going to live there. Montreal. I don't know. Turns to McGee. How the hell do you spell Montreal? No one replies. Listen, go to Canada. Any part of it. I'll find you. What? Never mind the furniture. We're going to live in a palace. Canada, that's all. You do as I tell you. Gets up from phone and goes center, looking at the money. As he sees everyone staring at him, he puts it in his pocket. What do you think you're going to do? You heard me, didn't you? I'm going to Canada. Canada? I hope to God you freeze to death. You mean to tell me you're going to steal that money? Why shouldn't I steal it from a gang of crooks like this? It's one chance in a lifetime to get this much money. You don't suppose I'm going to pass it up when I've got it right here in my kick, do you? Not me. I'm going to have one hell of a time for the rest of my life and send my two boys to college. Bland, over to Kennedy. Do you imagine we're going to stand by and let you get away with it? Kennedy whips out his gun and backs upstage a trifle. All but Bland and McGee back away from him. That's just what you're going to do. And I'm going to have my men keep you here all night until I get a damn good start. Bland knocks the gun from the chief's hand. McGee grabs his arms and pins them behind him. Bland gets a hold on his legs. Women scream and run halfway upstairs. I've got him. Get that money. Peters rushes towards Kennedy, yelling. I'll get it! I'll get it! Kennedy, yelling from the time he is grabbed. Let me go! Do you hear? Let me go! Peters grabs money from Chief's pocket. I got it! Cargan starts for Peters. Give me that money. Hayden starts for Cargan and grabs him by the arm when the latter is center. No, you don't, Cargan. That's my money. Don't let them get it, Peters. Let them try and get it. Bland and McGee release the chief. Now let me see you get it. Throws money in fire, laughing viciously. All stare into fire, watching the money burn. Watch the rotten stuff burn. McGee comes down center. What have you done? He's burned the money. A fortune. Good God. (sighs) Have my men here? And shoot you down like a pack of hounds! Starts up center as two pistol shots are heard outside. Bland goes left, near women. McGee goes upright. Cargan to table left. Max goes right. Kennedy goes up towards door. What's that? All turn and stare towards door. Max looks up on balcony and yells. Look! Look! All look up on balcony as he points to Myra, who is walking from room to room right. A ghost, a real ghost. Mary screams and grabs McGee. Mrs. Rhodes screams and grabs Cargan. Hayden crouches left. Bland jumps behind desk. Max huddles up in chair near fire. Peters is on his knees. Take her away. I didn't mean to kill her. Take her away. Kennedy yells. Let me out of this place. It's a graveyard. Starts for door. Door flies open and the owner enters. All stare at him. Hayden, after a pause. The seventh key. The seventh key. Mary runs to Mrs. Rhodes' right. McGee goes up center. Kennedy. To owner. Who are you? Owner, standing at door. I'm the owner of Ballpate Inn. Two policemen refused to allow me to pass, and I shot them dead. McGee comes down to center. What? What? This isn't true. This can't be true. (laughs) I'm a raving maniac. Owner, comes downstage right of McGee. I just arrived, Billy. I motored from New York. I expected to find you alone. Looks around at people. 
circles upright and back to center. Who are these people? How did they get in here? Have they disturbed you in your work? How are you getting on with the story? How am I getting on? Great heavens, man, to what sort of a place did you send me? Nothing but crooks, murderers, ghosts, pistol shots, policemen, and dead people walking about the halls, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and keys, and keys, and keys. You win, I lose. Twenty-four hours. Why, I couldn't write a book in twenty-four years in a place like this. My God, what a night this has been. Ona starts laughing. Then all join in, laughing and talking, ad-lib. McGee stands looking at them in utter amazement. (laughs) I'm not going to hold you to the wager, Billy. I just want you to know that it isn't real. What isn't real? Mrs. Rhodes steps towards McGee, smiling. I'm not a real widow. Crosses to foot of stairs. Mary comes down center. The owner goes up to desk, laughing. Cargan comes to McGee. I'm not a real politician. Goes upstage. Kennedy, down to McGee. I'm not a real policeman. Back upstage. Peters comes downstage to McGee. This isn't real hair. Takes off wig and goes upstage right. Hayden goes to McGee's center. These are not real whiskers. Takes off whiskers and goes upstage left. That wasn't real money that was burned. Goes upstage right. Max, over to McGee's center. These are not real handcuffs, see? Breaks handcuff and goes upstage right. Myra, appears on balcony right. I'm not a real dead one. Hearty laugh from all. McGee, to Mary... After looking around in amazement, goes to her left center. Are you real? Owner comes downstage to center. Not a real newspaper reporter. I mean a real girl. Mary smiles. That's for you to say. McGee turns to Owner. Well, for heaven's sake, don't keep me in the dark. Explain. Tell me what it all means. It means, old boy, that I wanted to prove to you how perfectly improbable and terrible... Those awful stories you've been writing would seem if such things really and truly happened. I left New York an hour ahead of you today. I got to Royton at nine o'clock tonight, went directly to the Empire Theater, told the manager of our bet, framed the whole plan, engaged the entire stock company, hired half a dozen autos, shot over to Asquan after the performance, and we arrived at the top of the mountain at exactly twelve o'clock. Since then, you know what's happened. I've been watching the proceedings from the outside, and if it were not for the fact that I'm nearly frozen stiff, I'd call it a wonderful night. All laugh heartily. You did this to me. Owner laughs. (laughs) You're not mad, are you? Of course, if you want to go through with a bet, why, uh... (laughs) No thanks, the bet's off. I've had enough of bald pate. Me for the commercial house until the train is ready to start. Over to Mary, left center. Is your real name Mary? She nods affirmatively. Well, Mary, the shots in the night, the chases after fortune, and all the rest of the melodrama may be all wrong. But will you help me prove to this man that there really is such a thing as love at first sight? All show interest. How can I do that? Don't you know? Well, you don't want me to say it, do you? McGee whispers in her ear. She nods affirmation. Now remember your promise, Mary. Hearty laugh from all as he kisses her. Lights go out, and black drop falls for about 30 seconds. End of Act 2. Epilogue for Seven Keys to Bald Paint by George M. Cohen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Epilogue Curtain goes up again. Fire is out, and lock replaced on door. The stage is bare. 
Typewriter is heard clicking from room right on balcony. The clock strikes twelve. Elijah Quimby is seen outside waving a lantern, as he did in the first act. Mrs. Quimby appears, etc. Same business, except that instead of unlocking the door, he raps on it. When McGee enters from room right and gets to center of balcony, Quimby raps again. McGee comes out on balcony with hat and coat on and carrying the suit and typewriter case and a manuscript under his arm. He stops on stairs, and as he hears Quimby's rap, he comes down the stairs, puts the cases on the table left, and then goes up to the door and unlocks it. McGee, as he opens the door. Come right in, folks. You're right on time, I see. Closes door and locks it. Quimby comes down right center. We've been out there ten minutes waiting for the clock to strike. Mrs. Quimby comes down right center. Lord, I didn't think we'd find you alive. McGee comes down center. The only difference between me and a real live one is that I'm tired, hungry, and half dead. Quimby, left of Mrs. Quimby. How'd you come out? Did you finish your book? McGee, handing Mrs. Quimby the manuscript. Allow me. What do you think of that, Mother? Lord, wrote all that in 24 hours. Just made it. Finished work a couple of minutes ago. Were you disturbed at all? Never heard a sound. Sits at table left. No ghosts. Nary a ghost, Mrs. Quimby, except those concealed in the manuscript. Rises. How about the Ascawan Hotels? I'd like to get a bath and a bite to eat before I take that train. There's the commercial house. The commercial house. That's strange. I guessed the name. How? I've got it in the story. Mrs. Quimby, aside to Quimby. What's he mean, Lodge? Quimby, aside. Darn if I know. To McGee. The missus has got a fine breakfast waiting for you up at our house. And a nice feather bed for you to take a nap in. The train don't go till five. And the drummers all say the hotel's rotten. Lord, I'm tired. Sits at table left. Me for the breakfast and the feather bed. Some wild and woolly scenes have been enacted in this room since you left last night, Mrs. Quimby. What happened? Nothing really. Just in the story. What's he mean, Lodge? How do I know? Telephone rings. Quimby start and look toward it. McGee goes to phone, stops buzzer, and then goes left. There's Bentley. He's pretty near on time. Will I talk to him? Of course. That's the idea, isn't it? Quimby goes to phone. Mrs. Quimby stands center, watching him. Hello, hello, Mr. Bentley? Yes, sir, I got it right here, sir. Two minutes ago, sir. I'll have to find that out. Wait a minute. To McGee. What's the name of the story? It's typewritten on the cover. Mrs. Quimby holds up script and reads by the light of the lantern. Seven keys to Baldpate. Quimby, in phone. Seven keys to Baldpate. To McGee. He's laughing. Pause. Then to McGee. He says there's only one. In phone. Hello? What, sir? Wait, I'll see. To McGee. You want to talk to him? No. Uh, yes, just a minute. Goes to phone. Quimby's go right center and stand listening. Hello? Hello? Al, I'm going to collect that 5000 from you, old pal. Yes, yeah, some title, isn't it? And say, some story. Wild, terrible, horrible melodrama, as usual. The kind of stuff you always roast me about. Treat it as a joke, however, this time. And say, Hal, listen. I've got you in the story. Yes, really. No, oh, I didn't mention your name or anything. And say, I'm in the story, too. Oh, I'm the hero. Say, Hal, this thing's going to sell over a million copies. The what? The critics? Laughs. <laughs> I don't care a darn about the critics. This is the stuff the public wants. Yes, I'll meet you at the 44th Street Club at 2.30 tomorrow. Adlib, as the curtain falls. Slow curtain. End of epilogue. End of Seven Keys to Baldpate by George M. Cohen.